We first met Mr. Yunga Pale in 2013 in Kenyatta University when he came to give a public lecture in Kenyatta University. And that is the point when uh, I remember in that forum there was Mr. Yunga Pala and uh, Mr. Kiriamiti. Yeah. And okay, so I, I guess I'll start off. I just want to say uh, it was very nice listening to Eunice speak. Huh? Uh, she said some very kind. But then I think what is most impressive is to see the output of what the Writers Guild has done, the number of people that have benefited from this sort of a consortium, this collective, and, and how it continues to build people. So that, that, that's amazing. I think uh, you guys must be applauded for that. And everybody else within the team, I know that I had Rahema as part of uh, this um, old Nini, um, this, this old, part of the founders of this clique. Huh? So keep up the good work. What you're doing is incredibly important. Thank you for inviting me. I'm always surprised that I still remain relevant in, in, in media because writers and columnists, we have a sell by date, you know? So when your time is done, you exit the stage and you leave it for the next person, you know? So it's always nice when uh, people who are much younger than me still acknowledge my writing. So thank you that, very much for that. I'm hearing a bit of an echo, is that okay? <clears throat> That's from Eunice and I've, I've uh, okay. muted okay. her. So I, I think I'll start with a basic introduction just for those who perhaps uh, have not encountered my work uh, and are not very familiar with my personal story, nothing too grand about it. I entered the newspaper space. Um, I, first of all, I would describe myself as a, as, a, as a writer first, an editor, and now a curator, right? a content curator. Curator being somebody who gathers different sorts of content together and puts it together in a, in a thematic way. In the same way you can become a curator in a, in a museum, you put together a collection. Um, and then I edit, I presently am the, um, they call me the curator, the title is curator in chief of the elephant.info. So kindly check it out if you've never been to that site before. It's a progressive knowledge platform. It deals with social political African issues and um, and we basically try and explain society to the people. Yeah, so check it out. Um, and if you're interested in writing, please pitch us. We're always very interested in new and exciting voices. Huh? Yeah, we also do long reads. So we're not afraid of words. Huh? I know most people are used to sort of short reads. The average elephant article um, goes up to 2,500, up to even 5,000 words. Huh? So, um, Please, uh, don't be intimidated. I've shared the link. I've shared the link in the. Ah, lovely. I've shared the link in the chat so they can be able to pick it from there. Okay, so so I'll, I'll quickly tell you this is my format. It'll just be a chat because I found this method works best with this kind of forums. Um, I, I as a disclaimer, I always say I'm not an expert. I'm merely somebody who's been on this journey slightly longer. So I probably have I have a fifteen or so year head start on most of you guys. Uh, so I hope then you learn from my own experience, you learn from my own uh, insights, and also from what I term as my mistakes. Right? So I start out like every, like, like most people in the, in the mid nineties, when I'm towards the late nineties, when I'm in University of Nairobi, I'm doing a, I'm not doing a literature course, I'm doing a, a bachelor's degree in anthropology, totally unrelated to writing. I think the way anthropology has been taught in university is terrible. It's a, it's, it, has, it was an injustice. We didn't know at the time. Um, but I'm like everybody else at that age, you know, in your early 20s, you're unsettled. You're trying to figure out what's going on in the country. This is the period when multipartism has been is agitating. You know, 1997, um, the first formidable challenge against Daniel Moy, uh, on which the opposition fails to unite and loses, there's Wangari Madai in the background there, trying to save Uhuru Park and Karura Forest. So this is what's going on. Uh, people are going into exile. So therefore, the lead writer at the time are people like Wahome Mtai, who we know as Whispers. Wahome Mtai himself has just been, he's, he's been put in, in Nyai House in, in, in jail. He's been released. 
And so it's, very, it's a very difficult time to be an artist. It's a very difficult time to be in the media profession. Uh, organizations like Society, a magazine called Society that was done by um, Gito Emanyara, um, and Nairobi Law Monthly, things have been shut down. <clears throat> so therefore, in order for sort of some of us to enter media, we knew that if you're going to write politically, you are going to be in a place of risk. Right? So you, those, those are direct risks to it because, uh, because uh, Moi's regime was very hard on media. Um, so we come in with the idea of just, we almost stumbled into writing because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not particularly trying to be a writer. I'm merely a guy in university who's just observing the social dynamics of what's happening in your, in your early 20s. Uh, Nairobi is going through a very interesting time because remember, this is when what, what Pasalelo Kantai, a Kenyan writer called Pasalelo Kantai, called the ridiculous generation. The ridiculous generation, remember the ridiculous, um, John Kiare, uh, Nyambane, Walter Mungare, and uh, what's, our, what's the third wheel called? Um, Tony Juguna. So, so we've got, this generation has come to four, and these are my peers, um, they have come to four. On this other end, we've got Kala Mashaka, if you guys remember Kala Mashaka happening, you know. So th there's agitation under the ground here. The youth is getting agitated. They're trying to find their own voice. They're trying to find their own space. Right? So we come in, we arrive into writing at this time. Now, I arrive completely on the fringe. I'm minding my own business. Um, a friend advises me to, to write something for a magazine that I'm doing in university. I write it out. It's half decent. Somebody said, I think you should write more. So I get my first acknowledgement that somebody tells me, oh, you, you wrote something that made sense. Yeah. At that point, I have no illusions whatsoever that I even have this as a skill set. So what happens is that around that time, I'm, I'm, I'm the hustle in university, I have a part-time job as a, um, as a gym instructor. So I'm there in the gym, you know, getting all these middle-class people to sort of lose weight for the next wedding, you know, everybody there, you know, their prosperity, trying to look in shape. And this is the time when sort of like modern gyms have just come into the country. So I'm one of those instructors. Interesting enough, the guy then who then pushes me, and you might know him, he became uh, the senator for Mandera, Bilo, Bilo Kero. So one time I'm with Bilo Kero in the gym, and I start explaining to him some concept known as spot reduction, saying that no matter how many sit-ups you do, you can't get rid of the fat in your stomach just by focusing on the stomach. You have to do the entire body because you can't do spot reduction. So I explained this concept to him and he's so impressed by how well I've explained it. And he says, you know, I've been coming to the gym here for years. Nobody has told me something as basic as this. Why don't you write it down? And I think, okay, this is an old man I respect. Let me, let me, let me, let me write it down. So I write it down and the next day in the gym, I, sh I show him the, 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 the piece I've done. And he looks at it and he says, this stuff is, should be in the newspaper. And, uh, and I said, but I don't know anybody in the newspaper. And, he's, and he mentions that, hey, listen, huh? go to the nation, the somebody I know in sales, tell them I sent you. Having nothing to lose whatsoever, <clears throat> I, walked, I, walked, I walked to Nation Media, Nation Media Center, just the new center just been built, the Twin Towers, out on Kimathi Street. And, and I walk into the cells, and if you've been to a proper nation, a newsroom, back in the days when the cells were cells, the pre-corona the pre days, it's a marketplace. It's busy. So you try and make noise here, nobody pays any attention to you. So I figure, um, how about I just go to the second floor, because there's some people I used to admire up there. Let me see if I can find the guys of sports, like Elias Makori, you know, just sort of say hello to all these sort of celebrity journalists I've been hearing all about, you know. Maybe I could run into Kwendo Panga, you know, Ong Tai. So I walk up to the second floor. And the second floor was where an editor known as Mundio Mushiri used to sit. And Mundio Mushiri was the editor behind Saturday Magazine. Uh, at this time, Saturday Magazine has just been formed as a new magazine. So newspapers have started including what they call magazine inserts, right? Which is what became Saturday Magazine. And it sort of mimics a small magazine and it comes with its own advertising. And it's very thin to particular consumer base. In this case, the consumer base was the emerging middle class that Nairobi was starting to show. So I go up to the floor and I meet Mundio Mishiri. And those were the days when you type out your stuff on a piece of paper from, a, from literally sometimes, for me, it was a typewriter, you know? And he looked at my stuff and he said, hmm, interesting. 
uh, do you have a number I can reach you? So I didn't have a number. Back in the days we had uh, email was Yahoo uh, and Hotmail. But in, in the university, there was a phone booth. And the guys who used to, next to the phone booth, were guys used to do, there used to be a Kenyozi and they used to be my guys. So all of us, if we wanted phone calls, we just ask guys to call the phone booth. And those guys would pretend to be, you know, you know what I mean? The guy's just been sly. You know, I'll take his, his message, I'll get back to you. It's just your guy, basically. So I didn't get, I, I didn't get any message for, for over three weeks. And then somewhere, just the fourth week when I'm thinking, ah, that didn't go anywhere. I get a message from my Kenyoza guy telling me, hey, somebody from NMG called you. You should go. So when I go to NMG and I go up to the second floor, Mundi Amishiri shows me literally the newspaper and says, okay, we published that piece. Can I get another one? And that's how it starts. And that time the piece was really small. I think I was given a 100 and I don't remember the word count. It was like, a, it, was, it was less than, it was less than 400 words, you know? In fact, my piece used to be, if you remember, those of you who might remember, um, um, my piece used to be the size of the radio kilowatts ad. There used to be a radio kilowatts thing that, that you know that, what do you call it? That is Shara um, Ovradi, the, the, the symbol for a, for a lightning bolt. Huh? There used to be a radio kilowatts ad. That was the space, literally. That's how much space. I started with literally less than, um, less than 400 words. But that was my first piece. I even remember what the first article was. My first article was that, can you get HIV in a gym through sweat? You know, because there was a time when HIV was a big issue and everybody was, uh, was dealing with this new pandemic to, to, to some degree. So it's interesting about life being deja vu, that there are very many parallels to what's happening in Corona now and when HIV first came into the country. So it starts from there. So I start off with the fitness column. Um, largely encouraged by, by Mundi Amshiri, who then challenges me to start doing feature writing. And I do a couple of features for Saturday Nation. And then there's a change of editors to a lady called Rhoda Orengo, who one day just confronts me and says, hey, listen, we're doing a column about men and we're looking for ideas. Could you throw something for us? And I throw a piece and she likes it. And that, be that becomes the beginning of the Mantok journey. And so about 2000, I get, we start off writing Mantok as three writers, Tony Muchama, who you all know, uh, who became now one of our more serious writers in the country. And this is a guy called Clyde Movit, rest in peace, Alan Kopar, but he died. So, so eventually I was given the column about 2000 and I started writing this thing called Mantok, which has basically became a column that was critiquing um, basically gender relationships in, in a time of modernity, as the city was evolving how are men and women interacting with each other? Obviously, I was young. My, 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 my column was really controversial for its day, but I got a little feedback. And over the course of about 10 years, I grew greatly. So I moved from the column. I wrote the column until about 2010, after which I moved on to radio. And I did a late night, late night radio, um, radio show called Late Night Capital, those of you who might remember, anybody who was uh, in the 70s, who was born in the 70s might remember it. Uh, Late Night Capital. This is the show then Nini Washira took over after me. You know, so that was, that was the show I used to do. And then I did a couple of magazines along, along the way. I did a magazine called Sports Monthly, which still exists, wasn't a very successful magazine. Um, and then I did a little small gigs and eventually around 2007, I got picked up to do a magazine called Adam. Some of you might have remembered it. Kenya's first lifestyle magazine. And I, and I did that for about two years or so. Left that, then got a column with, um, with, the, with, the, with the standard, Crazy Monday. My editor at the time was a guy called Ted Malanda, who I think is one of the best humor, humor writers we have in the country, completely under, underrated. One of, one of the wittiest writers, we have, we have, at least of my generation. Um, and, 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 then, and then I moved from that. I always wrote um, every so often all over the place. I got involved with TV in a production company known as Spillworks Media. I did a lot of TV shows as a head writer. If you might have seen a show called Sumula Penzi, Jane and Abel. So we're some of the guys behind that, that, that writing. And uh, then eventually in my, in my, my, as I approached middle age, I was 
called on to do the elephant. Now, first of all, as a curator, and now as the curator in chief, which is just a fancy title for the editor, the guy who does all the managerial admin stuff. So, so that's the gist of my journey. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy who just basically found himself on the job. I didn't intentionally start out to become a writer and, and, and I still have not arrived. You know? So I'm a writer who's learning, still learning how to write, still learning how to find my voice, still learning how to get better. Now, what I'd like to share very sort of broadly is, is, is a number of lessons that I've learned and then bring it down to what I think would be my core theme for, for this talk, which is finding your purpose, you know? Why do we actually write? You know, why, of all the professions you could choose, you know? I mean, choose something as steady as an MPESA agent, you know? You're guaranteed you're going to get money. Why the hell do you want to write? You know, of all the professions you could choose in your life, what, what Kichagani brings into this profession? This is the thing that we must interrogate deeply because if you don't understand it, then this profession becomes, it can become very, very, very frustrating. And, and, and I think it's important that you guys are, are told the truth. So we, cause I, I find a lot about writing is glamorized. There's a lot of romanticization about writing, you know, like, oh, writers, we just, you know, we sit down with our computers and we have our lattes and we're always sitting somewhere nice, like across a beach and we're putting together these beautiful words that just seem to flow. That's not the reality, you know? that's the movies. Now, my core experience, and there's many different kinds of writers, so I can only speak about the kind of writing that I have done. I, I, am, not a, I am not a novelist, so, um, so I can't talk about novels. You know? I've, I've, I know a lot of novels that I've enjoyed, but I've never really taken the plunge and written one of my own. However, I have written columns, and I have written many, many columns. I have written columns for over a decade, close to two decades. So at least on that particular subject, I can speak with some level of authority. Yeah. Now, one of the things that Collins had taught me, because a column is, is it's a slog. You've got to show up every week, whether you feel good or you feel bad. You know, you're like, you're like I don't know, you're like, a, you're like a guy on a TV show. You know, you've got to show up. You know, Papa Shirandula, you know, you've got to show up. You know, there's no, oh, I'm having a bad day, I'm not inspired. Every Saturday, people pick up the paper, they want to read your byline, they hope to be either entertained, amused, or provoked, or even irritated by what you have to write, but they demand a reaction. So you have to dig in every time to produce that thing, to produce, in a way, a performance. So the column in itself becomes a stage. And every Saturday, I have to show up there and say, this is who I am. You know what I mean? You have to be vulnerable, you have to reveal, because right, an audience connects to your honesty. All of us can do the PR thing. One of the examples, and all due respect, because I think he's an incredible public intellectual, but PLO, Patrick Lumumba, um, Lodge, Patrick Lodge Lumumba Otieno, and speaks really well. But I think the, the challenge we saw always have with Lumumba is that after he spoke, none of us could remember what he really said. But we could all agree that he spoke really well. That was, there was always a consensus. Man, the guy, I mean, I, but the brother can speak. You know, the, the diction, you know, the, the wordplay. But if you ask ourselves, what was he really talking about? And we got just dazzled by the words, but we didn't get the sense of meaning. Because at some point, we never quite grasped Lumumba's vulnerability. He was a guy who was always just, I don't know, he was just correct. He always seemed to be on top of his subject. Now, what I found as a writer, what really made us, what really made me have a connection with, with an audience at the time, because when you start to write, you write in isolation. Just like you guys now, it's like talking to Zoom now. You have no idea how your audience is responding. You know, even if a guy is bored out of his mind, you know, somebody's decided to start rolling chapos, we might as well make use of this, this, this hour. You know, you don't know how people are responding. But ultimately you start to get feedback. And one of the feedback I started getting was the fact that people could say that you're vulnerable. I can relate to your story. I have been in your shoes. You know, I'm somebody who I was somebody who, who was saying, I don't have all the answers. And I think it's very, very important when you start writing in whatever subject that you choose. Yes, you must pick up some level of expertise on the subject matter you're trying to grapple with. But ultimately, when you're writing, you have to come from a place of vulnerability. And that's what I learned as a columnist. Vulnerability means honesty, which means if I'm an, if I'm an emotion, I have to say it as it is. 
been very clear that there will be consequences. Because if we say certain things, not everybody's going to like what we have to say. Ultimately, it's just one opinion. And the very fact that you have the authority to express your opinion means you can get a counter opinion. So the thing that the column then teaches me very quickly is the moment you're vulnerable is that people will come after you. So writing forces you to pick up a very thick skin because we tend to we tend to want two things. When you start out writing, you want the good, you want the good, you want the good accolades. You know, you want the um, the positive feedback. So when you're standing there, I, I share a piece with with the Writers Guild. I want to go back and say, wow, 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 all the wows. This is this is writing. Hmm? This guy inspires me. That's the kind of feedback we want because we are putting so much work in the background. When we go out there, it's like we're serving a meal. You have cooked so hard in the background. When you put the meal there, you want people to be licking their fingers, you know, just, it's a feast of eyes even before they've even dug into the food. You don't want the kind of food where I put dig in and suddenly guys take a bite and they go, I mean, siski ja. You know when suddenly somebody has hadn't tested your food and they've already sort of switched opinions. So be very wary about craving for good feedback. Right. In fact, the people you should really pay attention to are the guys who are telling you you're crap. Because what will happen in the early days, everybody will tell you, oh, no, you're, you're okay. I like your writing. You know, you have something, you know. And then once in a while, you'll do something beautiful and somebody will say, you know, you deserve a column. You should be in the newspapers. I don't even understand why people haven't, the nation hasn't picked you up. It's very easy to get attached to that kind of feedback. The kind of feedback you really need, and this is the feedback of the reality of the profession, is that people are going to cut you down. In fact, in the writing profession, get used to long knives. People will always cut you down. And somebody told me something very important very early in my career, and the man was named Zain Abubakar, who you might know. He was once a member of parliament for the East African Assembly. Yeah, but Right now, he's the chairman, CEO of, of Muhuri. Uh, the human, uh, the Muslims' human rights organi organi organization huh? at the coast. And Zen Al-Bakr said that when people stop criticizing your writing, does he not make an impact? Good writing, good writing is going to set up an emotion. Usually we want the positive one, but any emotion, good writing will set off an emotion, right? So, Get used to both levels of feedback, the good and the bad. Yes, there'll be some time you need to switch off all the bad that's coming through, but develop a very tough skin. Because what's going to happen is this. In the beginning, people will say nothing. So you'll be writing for what seemed like a very long time and you'll hardly get any feedback. Then at some point, you will cross over to, to a place where people start to really know what your writing is about. And suddenly there's a lot of feedback. Be very careful that you don't get attached to your feedback. Right? Because what happens is that you carry baggage. And as Jeff Kwananga used to say, you're only as good as your last story. So it doesn't matter as a columnist how beautiful my last article was. It was so great, it was brilliant. Or younger, that was just amazing. That was a kaleidoscope of, 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 of visuals and, and imagery and people give this beautiful uh, um, feedback. But you have to let go of that story because next week you need a new story, right? So don't get attached to your so-called greatness, your last piece. Do the piece, be done with it, walk away from it, and start again. So that became my philosophy, start again, start again, which means every time you are, you are in point A. One of the best analogies I ever got was Nelson Mandela talks about climbing mountains. And if you've ever seen something they call a mountain range, a mountain range means when you look from the bottom, all you see is the first peak. When you get to the top of that peak, you see another peak and another peak. So it's a continuous series of peaks, hence the reason why it's called a range. Now, if you're climbing as a climber and somebody who has ever tried to do mountaineering, people like us, is you will get to the first peak and you think you got high. But in order to get to the next peak, there's no cable car. You have to go down again in order to rise up again and you go down again to go to the next peak. And that's the nature of writing. No matter how beautiful your piece was, no matter what peak it hit, you have to come down and start again. 
So always remember your peaks, you know? When you get a peak, enjoy it for a moment, but come down and start again. The sooner you come down and the sooner you start again, the better it is for you as a writer. Because the idea you have to always remember is as a writer, you are in a perpetual journey. You're journeying, right? You're always, you're always, as Michelle Obama would say, you're always becoming. You never quite arrive. Those who have followed my work for the last 20 years will say what I was writing in the late 90s and what I'm writing now, those are two different people completely. You'd say this guy's not even related. This guy is from different continents. You know, there is no way this brash young man and this guy here can be the same person. But it's me. I have evolved. You know, my voice has changed. My experiences have shaped me in ways that have forced me to look at the world differently. So far, so good. So this was my understanding, first of all, of, of, of my purpose of writing, of like, how do I journey? The thing that I discovered as well was the idea of a niche. Now, when Eunice was describing me, she describes me as a guy who's known to write about men. And for a lot of guys, that's the box that I've been forced to live in. I mean, I've written about a lot of other stuff. You know, anybody who's following my editorials in, in The Elephant right now will say, wow, this guy's writing about stuff that's very different. But men, man talk, masculinity was my original niche. It was my opening role. It was my introduction to the public. I was the guy who was known as the critique. Now, it's important when you come into the writing space because there's so much stuff going on. You have to be known for something. You have to choose, in a way, choose a character. In the same way, actors are known for something. Later on, yes, you can be a versatile actor. You can try and add many roles. But it, it's important to have a niche. Because a niche forces you to pick up expertise. So as a result, why I started writing about men for was obvious reasons. One, I'm a guy. You know what I mean? So I don't really need to talk to other guys to about my own experience, about what I'm ex ex experiencing. Uh, number two, I was hanging around very heavily male activities, you know. So I was in sports, I was playing rugby, you know, I was hanging around a lot of guys. All my activities were just sort of guy related. You know, so I understood a lot of those dynamics. The more I started to interrogate it, I was able to go beyond what I was just calling basically base observations to go into the literature that written about guys, to go into the politics that was affecting masculinity at the time. And over time, I actually developed such deep expertise that if I was actually following through in university, I'd probably have a PhD level by now because I've had the privilege of speaking to people who were gender experts and they said, listen, you're 15 or so years writing about this subject makes you more of authority than those of us who have studied in school. So learn your niche, right? Learn your niche, your area of expertise, because it allows you to sort of deepen your knowledge. However, as a writer, you have to be versatile. Because what happens when the Mantok era stops? A guy like me, for all my, let's say, my writing gifts, at some point, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm no longer in the clubs anymore, man. I'm a guy who now needs to be in bed before nine o'clock. You know, back in the days, we'd be leaving the house at 11 p.m. That's when you're leaving the house. You're like, you know, okay, now the night is young. You're coming back in the house at five in the morning. You used to be part of that scene. Now all that has changed. Now you're a family guy. Your issues are completely different. At some point, you have to let go, which means that if you're not evolving as an individual writer, you get stuck. In the same way, you find this, what we call these characters sometimes in, in, in TV, who they can't act outside of their stereotypical role. Or a comedian who can't do any jokes outside of, una joga wa kisi. The people who just, they can't, because they're stuck. So while you might have a core niche, continue to evolve. Continue to evolve, which means let go of your so-called greatness. When you learn something really well, let go of it and start again. Which means for people like us, we became experts at writing columns. You know, we're doing columns like this, bam, bam, bam. It doesn't matter if I have a funeral, you know? I was burying my brother, but I was still submitting my columns. That's how good we became. I was traveling, at the time I was even traveling in Asia, but I was still doing my columns. You become very good at it. Then suddenly, I move into Adam Magazine, and I'm being told to do 
long prose features that are like 3,000 words, that involve a lot of research, that involve different voices. And I'm not as sharp again. And it takes me a very long time to build that up. And then I move into spaces like The Elephant that have a little bit more academic sort of writing to go, to go with them, a little bit more journalistic narrative. It's an entirely different space. When I move into the TV and I have to write scripts, it's an entirely different space. I move into radio and I have to do radio scripts, entirely different space. Continue to be versatile. Don't be afraid to start again because the moment you stop growing, you become stale. And once you get stale, what happens is your audience moves along. So, so I found that was a really important thing. Now, let me get sort of like not the meat of my substance, which is that what then becomes the artist's role? Why do we write? Like why of all the professions you could have chosen? And you know, and I said this about writing because I'm somebody who suffered greatly from trying to get any acknowledgement from my parents. You know? People really wanted to acknowledge and tell me, but please tell me that what I'm doing in my life is of some use. You know? My mother used to treat me like I wasted school fees. And she would just basically say, when is he getting a job? And that was a constant cry for almost 10 years. I'm at the height of my game as a columnist. I'm right up there with the top three in, in, in nation, alongside people like Mtai Nguni and, and Wahome and Whispers is my mentor. Can you believe that? You know, it's just like, you have a right. You know, you, this is somebody used to admire. When you look at ratings three years later, you are one or two ratings just behind him. And I'm at this height. And my mother is always saying, he needs a job. And she's always, you know, it's like, you know, the way mothers try and fix you up when you, when you try and get a bride, like a guy who's, you know, you've got into your late thirties and he just doesn't seem to be bringing a girl home. And the mother's always trying to fix you up. That's how my mother was with jobs. Always trying to fix me up. Always trying to fix me up. Even trying to get me an engineering job. <clears throat> Anything, just so I could have an office and appear to be doing something well. And for the longest time, I would tell my friends, for example, the guys I left campus with. And when you leave campus, there's always this hesitation because the guys who, for example, are in finance and in other professions like law, they get, they get, they get us picked up very quickly. And those of us who are in the arts, we seem to be just meandering around like, like pastoralists, you know, for three, four years. People ask me, like, well, what are you really doing? And I'll tell people, I write. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what do you do? So it's critical to understand why you write. Now, I can tell you my own understanding, my own lessons. When I started out, I can tell you it was sheer ego. Sheer ego. Remember I told you guys we must be vulnerable. I just, the idea that have a byline, the idea that you come over and you pick up the largest circulating paper in East Africa and you open about the magazine and that's my name, that's me. That's the guy they're talking about. That guy, that article, that's me. All those letters, the editor, yes, that's, that's me. That was the beginning, you know? And then at some point, it starts to come with some money. You go to places and people recognize your name. At some point, people recognize your face. And you sort of get to this point of, I'm somebody important, you know? Uh, parents are saying, no, 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 you meet the writer. Have you met the writer? No, I started reading when I was a very young man. I think you should read Ego. And trust me, writers have a lot of ego. And it's something you have to tame. Because ego works in two ways. Huh? That's why they say the ego is the enemy. Yeah. Because ego tells you, first of all, that you're the greatest thing that ever happened. You know, It's like you're the voice that I've been waiting for. That great Kenyan novel that everybody's waiting for. Finally, the man has been chosen. The time has arrived. Hmm? He is here. The same ego can tell you you're the most useless thing that has walked on this face of the earth. Makaratas, useless. Hmm? Why are you even trying to do this profession? The same ego. That is why writers get depressed. Writers get incredibly uh, egotistical. So you have to tame your ego. You have to learn it. The ego in itself, you can't run away from it. But you've got to grapple with it the same way somebody grapples with their own demons. You know, madimoni. You know the way guys in Shark say, mazinu mashitanizangu, najoga mashitanizangu ubipuka. You know, you've got to understand your demons that way so that when the lipuka, you know, like, hey, this is, I'm, I'm in that space. Because the ego will take you up and down, up and down. So in writing, what happens, you do a lot of self-introspection, right? 
because you have to move beyond the ego because if you don't move beyond the ego what happens is that you end up doing something as editors we call it navel gazing when somebody writes a beautiful article but all they're talking about is just myself me 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 and then me then let me tell you what happened with me you know and you're wondering okay fine it's good to have a first person voice but invite people into your story let your story be open up so other people can can you know can can find space within your story but if the story just becomes about you it's what in editing we call a rant it's beautiful like for an if you gave me a story as an as an editor i'd say beautiful story but it is a rant it's just about you it doesn't encompass other people a rant is great it can work beautifully on facebook you know but when you're writing it a writing is almost like a meal. They come up with some food called senior. You know, like a senior in the coast, that big tray. You put it down, allow people to, everybody should be able to dig in. That's what good writing should feel like. You present it and everybody can, let me have a taste of it. Like a big ugali, the one that the, the pussycat can't jump over. You know, everybody can have a, a bit of it. That's how good writing should be. But if you kind of do the writing that's only for you, just enough for you, then the most we can do is empathize. We can say, well, yeah, that's just so sad. You know, and yeah, hey, that guy's in pain. But it doesn't allow us to see ourselves within your story. So be very careful about the ego. The second reason we write, and especially if you're from my part of the world, uh, Luoland, is the aesthetic of the language, you know, the beauty of English, you know, the ability to make English sing, you know, just to be able to have beautiful prose. You know, just to put words down and guys go like, wow, eh? that guy can write. So, I mean, it was one of the things I really admire about Jackson Beaker, for example, who you guys might have read, is Jackson is one of those kind of writers, you know? He's, it's, in fact, when we used to edit him, we used to say, man, it's, it's, it's got flowers, you know? It's like, you, you start reading his, his stuff, it's just like, ooh, man, it's just like, shh, my words, you know? It's just, it's flowery. And there's something beautiful about a lot of what draws us to, in, to, to writing is, is the beauty of the language. But remember, like everything else, no matter how beautiful anything looks, and that's why I keep on going back to the analogy of food, no matter how well presented your food is, ultimately, when somebody bites into your chapo, does it have layers? Hmm? It can look really good, but it's a kind of chapo you can fold and bite into and feel, hey, uh, that's a chapo. I can feel the layers. So yeah, the beauty you must, not, you must not get obscured by the beauty. It's like the beautiful human being, the beautiful woman of no substance, of no personality. The guy who looks great is just like, wow, this guy's got an Idris thing going on. Until he opens his mouth, you're like, hey, boss, <laughs> just smile, eh? just look cute there. You know, don't talk, please. Huh? You, know those, you know those guys. Huh? So you don't want to have the kind of writing that it's beautiful. There's a guy called James Murua who described you described a very beautiful analogy of these guys who write very beautiful, but they have no substance. He says, he was describing this particular writer who I can't mention, uh, but he's saying it's like eating casserole, you know, like custard. It's just, it's tasty, it's tasty, it's tasty. But after a while, it starts to choke you. It's just too much sweetness. You know, like at some point you want, where's the, where's the substance in the story? So even as we're writing beautiful stuff, what's the meat? Is our hamburger layered? I mean, it's just like a thin slice of lettuce, you know? After we present a beautiful hamburger, you know that we, when you go to these hotels and you funo at the hamburger, you're like, hey, chief, what am I paying for here? Where's the meat? Where's the beef? So you've got to have some beef in your burger so that when somebody bites into it, it's like, yes, from, from a point of present, presentation, it's beautiful, but I bite into it and the substance. The other issue that I thought was very important that drives us towards writing is this idea of a historical impulse. So for example, a lot of my writing now has been introspection of understanding what happened in the past that creates the country, that puts the country in this state of this state that we're in. This state of basically what I like, what we call the Takayo syndrome. And if you're not heard of Takayo, look for a lady called Grace of Goat, The Land Without Thunder. The book is called The Land Without Thunder, and the story is the story of Takayo, which I really can't get into now. Uh, but Takayo is, it becomes a metaphor for a cannibalism. When a society starts to eat its own children, 
and you start to wonder what's happening to Kenya that right now that the society is eating its own children. You know, the leadership is literally cannibalizing its own children. Yeah. So what I started doing is starting to go back historically. And when you go back historically, you, of course, you come into the colonial period and you start to understand how systemic racism and whiteness became a very fundamental part of the Kenyan reality. Then you go back further before 1885, before the Berlin Wall, and you start going to the era of slavery. And you realize, wow, the African narrative of primitivity or the African as a lesser human being is enacted during the period of slavery, 14th century. And you go back beyond 14th century, and you find there exists an Africa that has been completely erased. Now, I am forced to write in order to understand my reality better. So I go back further. And the further back I go, the further forward I can look. The best analogy I can give you is a tree, which is why historical impulse is so important. Yeah? Because as Bob Marley said, if you don't know where you're coming from, you can't know where you're going. Right? So if you look at a tree, what we see as a tree, a great Mugumo tree, the great oak, the great um, uh, Jamna, uh, or, 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 um, or, or a Marubaine. You look at a tree, it's got a thick trunk. The real tree, the real growth of the tree is under the ground, right? And the deeper the tree grows under the ground, the bigger it grows upwards. So the real growth that's happening in the tree is really not on the surface, it's under the ground. What we are seeing as the tree is merely the manifest of what's happening under the ground unseen. In the same way, writing is how much you read, how much you research, how much you introspect is what we see as beautiful writing on the outside here. So if you only, con if you only focus on what is manifest, what is obvious, and you don't go into introspection, and you don't go into challenging that that we say is the unseen, then you cannot have this beauty that comes out here. You have to go through the suffering that James Baldwin went through, or Ngugi Wadiyonga went through, in order to bring the kind of writing that is produced. Real writing comes out of deep introspection and lived experience. So as a writer, you have to live, or you have nothing to write about. It's very different from being alive. A lot of us are alive. You know, we are alive. We, you see us, you know, as I say, walking dead, Unatuona, we are there, lakini we are not there, you know what I mean? The nethering, we're just nethering all through, to mezuba. In order to be a writer, you have to live, you have to participate in whatever it is. It doesn't matter if your existence revolves around a kiosk where guys are making chapos. Leave that reality that when you start to describe it, you describe it like Shakespeare. You describe chapati making poker guys go and say, hey, I've never seen the connection between chapati and philosophy because you understand it so fundamentally deeply. When George Orwell starts to talk about, when he starts to describe brothels in Paris, in Paris, down and out in Paris, you're like, hey, this is, this is what was happening in, Europe, in the heart of Europe at the time. It was his lived experience. So you have to be immersed in the reality that you are in right now, not other people's reality. I see too many people saying, oh, I would like to write about this, but I only if I have the research or the opportunity to go there. Start writing with where you are. When we, when we look at American literature, or we look at American cinema, or look at American TV, why is it that when somebody tells you, what does an American cab look like, an American taxi, the first thing that comes to mind is what? A yellow car, right? With a thing on top. Why? Because the Americans consistently tell us about their lived experience. If you're talking about a Cuban taxi, it's a completely different looking car. But because you've not read enough Cuban stories where they're talking about their Cuban taxis, you don't have that visual. So then the assumption of a taxi becomes what becomes the New York taxi that we see in Sex and the City. So it's very important to write about your own experience, what you know, where you are. In the same way, you can only cook what you know and what you have. You love to cook caviar. You love to cook any of these fancy dishes. You cook with what you have. You go into your fridge, Gabriel, you open it, and what do you do? You cook what is in the fridge. So you write what you know and what is in your hands. You know, What is in your hands? What do I have around me? 
when I was living in the village for a couple of years, I ran away from Nairobi because the stress of the city got to me. And I went shags. And, and, I, couldn't, and I tried writing about Nairobi from the village, but it was impossible, you know, because the highlights of the village are very different. First of all, there's nothing going on between Monday and Saturday. Sunday is the only different day. You know, the highlight of the village is a wedding, or not even a wedding, a funeral. That's when the outsiders come in, the Nairobi guys come in with their water bottles, you know. Um, the village guys start to, we, we start to measure up with the relatives who have disappeared. The gossip comes in, Nani, that's Nani's child. That one used to be a criminal. This one was divorced. This one, this one I'm told their family has like an issue. You know, that was my reality. There was no highlight. The highlight was, oh, we were supposed to be given free fertilizer. Now the chief was supposed to give us condas. So the workshop that was supposed to be done in Yala has now been moved. Who has the Ndudi that will take us there? That's our highlight. That's all that's going around me. And I'm thinking, I can't write about this. The guys will tell me, Bana, chief, there's nothing going on. But then I speak to Ted Malanda. I tell him, but a boss, me, I'm stuck in the village here and I'm seeing some very interesting things. Would you guys be interested in it? After all, it sounds like crazy Monday-ish. And Ted Malanda then takes me and tells me, no, no, please write about sharks. And that's what bats crazy Monday. And I'm the guy who's the city guy. I'm the guy who's right about what is happening in the city, in the scene, the go-to guy, you know, like the fella, fella, Femi Kutis in town. I'm the guy who's reporting that story. Suddenly, I'm the guy who's telling you about my kazo was attacked by a python. His dog was eaten by a python. And what does that mean? What does it take a man to defend his household when a python, a python attacks his dog? Those are my realities. But shock on you. As soon as I started writing that, Yes, a lot of my old audience said I lost the plot, but I picked up an entirely new audience and it really deepened my writing. Because now I was writing from real experience. And that and the bath of Crazy Monday then took me into, I think what I'm doing at the elephant was largely bathed by what was happening in Crazy Monday. And Crazy Monday was because of my lived experience in the village. So the last thing I wanted to sort of tie it all around in terms of the purposes that I found that why I write is you've got to have what they call a political purpose. And when I talk about politics, people are very afraid of politics, but you've got to look at politics very broadly. Because when you think of siasa in Kenya, we think of Babowino, Sonko, Haponi Palipa Chafu, you know, when a siasa ni wachafu. You don't want to deal with siasa guys because they're just liars and they're, you know, they're crazy guys. But we all have to be political because politics is life. All life is politics. You know, so because if you don't have a political purpose, even when I was writing Mantok, I didn't know it at the time, but my politics, now that I look at it in, in retrospect, my politics was actually male masculinity. My politics was that the idea that, listen, we are African men and we are dealing with this reality differently. Our voice must be heard. That was my politics, which is why it grated people who were standing in what was then liberal feminism. They were like, no, 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 you can't say that. You are coming from a patriarchal space. And my argument was, no, 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 no. You're asking, you're accusing me of patriarchy, but I am, we are part of the system. That patriarchy that they're talking about, my mother is also part of that patriarchal system. You know, so we were trying to understand the quagmire in which we were understanding ourselves, which we found ourselves as men. Because we were trying to say, we are not, we don't base our reality on liberal Western values. We based our reality on African social values. That was my politics, right? Where I am right now at the elephant, my politics is all about the African voice. The fact that African voice has to be on the table. That if there's an issue happening in Mali, we're not going to wait for a correspondent coming out of Europe or France to tell us what's happening in Africa. We want to hear it on our own terms. If there's something happening in the States, we're no longer waiting for the American columnists to tell us. We're like, no, no, no. We're seeing what's happening in America. This is our opinion of Donald Trump. And this is why we think you Americans are in problems. And you could learn a lot from us Kenyans, especially how not to rig elections. Yeah. So those are the politics. Everybody has to have politics. And writers are by their very nature political. If you've heard of a guy called Frank Fanon, and if you've not heard about Frank Fanon, please, Find him, Franz Fanon. Find him. Wretched of the earth, black skins, white mask. Frank Fanon starts to write, he's writing in the, he's, he's a guy from Martinique, an island in the Caribbean islands, Martinique. 
goes to France, then joins the uh, Algerian liberation struggle, right? His profession is as a, as a psychiatrist. So he starts out as a psychiatrist on the battlefield, looking at troubled soldiers, and that's what creates him to write a book that looks into the pathology of whiteness. What happens to the colonized subject? What happens to us, me, an African, who is now called Gabriel, whose grandfather was not even a Christian, and suddenly, one generation later, everybody in his family has been made into an image that's not of the original source. What happens to you when somebody com confuses your pathology to the point, even as an African, you start to hate yourself? What goes on? How, how does it become that an entire region, an entire continent suffers from the same pathology of, of, of inferiority? What happens? This is what Fanon interrogates, and he interrogates it in a way that no other writer, I think, before or since has done, right? And to date, Fanon continues to be relevant to anybody, any one of us. Any, we all discover, we all have our Fanon time. We, you discovered Fanon, right? So politics is incredible, and writers is what is the people who move society forward. So if a society has no writers, which is part of our problem. If you think about Kenya, up until the late 70s, Mishere Mugo, Ngugi Gwabiongo, uh, Okot Pabitek, but it's not Pabitek, as I found out when I went to Acholiland. It's Pabitek, you know? Uh, uh, Okot Pabitek, Taban Lolyong, um, Ali Mazrui. We have a whole bunch of intellectuals at the University of Nairobi pushing forward our literature. This literature is what takes us through the dark ages of, of Moy, and the reason I call it the dark ages is when Moy suppresses intellectualism. It's the literature that is done by Major Mwangi. It's the literature done by David Mailo. In literally, we have 20 years of where there's no literature. And we're relying on the politics or political writings of the people who came before us, which is why when Binya Vanga in 2002, uh, post 2002 and later on, starts with Kwani, yeah? And we start with people like Yvonne, that, which is why it felt like a moment of renaissance. Because for the longest time, Kenyan voices had been scattered. So as writers, you have to have a political purpose, whether you know it or not, you have to understand what your political purpose is because you're speaking on behalf of. So if you have access of a platform, please be mindful of what you can do with that platform. I came to that realization quite late in my day in Mantop, when one day some, some writer who, who I got a letter and it sounded, it sounded like an elderly woman, somebody who had in the vein of my, of my aunt, who told me, and in very explicit terms, you know, you're wasting that space. You've got a beautiful platform and you're wasting it. And she said it so deeply, not in ways, not in this, I'm, I'm trying to sort of re-emphasize re, re the tone. And you're wasting time. Yes, you're a great writer, but you're wasting that space. You could be moving the society forward, but you're doing nothing. All you're doing is just basically sensationalizing. And she was right. Because there was a time where I got into the whole idea of just, you want a reaction. You know what I mean? You just want to provoke. You know, you know as, as we say on Twitter now, Melissa, how? Melissa. You know? So when you write the next column, you're just like, Melissa, how? Hey. Huh? come, Kali. Yeah, we'll so that was the whole thing, just a reaction, reaction, reaction. But this woman challenges me. So I'm forced to sit back and interrogate and say, what am I really saying? Am I responsible for, 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 my, for, for, my, for my words? Can I stand by what I have written? And that's what starts to in, go into introspection of understanding, what am I really talking about? And I discover that my, my core issue is not a gender war. That is my mistake. This is my limitation. Because I go into battle thinking, oh, women are against us, so let's defend ourselves. And women are like, no, this guy hates us. And I'm busy there saying, no, no, I don't hate you. I'm just trying to speak the truth. And there's nothing as annoying as telling somebody who is opposed to you that, no, 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 no. I'm just trying to speak the truth. It never works. You know, when you tell somebody, you know, I don't mean to judge, but you know, it never works. So it forces me to step back. And when I step back and I realize this matrix, it's a social reality. This social reality has a history. At what point did we come to become a society that, that men and women start to compete? 
And when you understand it properly, you start to realize, huh, we are in something called a neoliberal order, what they call the neoliberal order. And the neoliberal order means we're in, 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 in social competition, where perpetually the entire structure is all about capital extraction and profit. You're only as useful as we can profit from you. Now, what happens then is that as the society starts to change, occupations that were traditionally male start to disappear, things that we call the industry. They start to disappear. And what happens? New occupations start to arise that bring women into the work, workplace. Now, because of the breakdown of the social unit, what do men start to do? We start to start saying, hang on a minute, the women are eating into our position because suddenly I have no guarantee of work. It works in the exact same way as if you're an immigrant, like say someone like me now in Europe, and I start to prosper in this country. The, the first thing the Muzungu looks at me and says, ah, this guy who just came here the other day here, now he's driving a car, he lives in a better neighborhood, he can't even speak my language. And me, I'm a native here. And that's what creates that resentment. And that was what was happening. At the core level was men were resenting the progress of women. Women had also been socialized to believe that men were the problem. So we, neoliberal society sets us up against each other. Yet we come from traditional societies where we always used to do what? We used to coexist. We used to support each other. We used to be a unit, you know, which is why we would say, you want to see a strong man, look at his wife. You want to see a prosperous woman, look at the husband. It was always about interdependence and everybody had very clear roles. But you know, liberal, liberalism disrupts everything. And this is what I had not understood. But once I understood the politics of what I was dealing with, then I was able to take the right thing further and to deepen the knowledge and to provide information that was quite useful. So let, let me round it up with this way, in this way, then I can open it up to questions. Is ultimately, as one of my greatest, um, the people that I really admire right now who have gotten into, James Baldwin, who has become very relevant for me during this, in understanding what's happening in America and in Black Lives Matter. And James Baldwin asked the question of what is the purpose of the writer? What is, what is the idea of integrity for a writer? And my own understanding now is for anybody who is entering writing at this particular time, you know, especially you guys who have been called upon, of all the things you could be doing. I mean, this is the, this is the hustler generation. You know, I mean, you could be selling masks, you know, Jack Ma's masks, you know, are floating somewhere. Somebody could be making good mullah. You know, you guys have decided you want to write. So what is your purpose? And I believe as a society, as a generation, and I speak specifically as a Kenyan, we are in deep, deep, deep problems. And we need our writers, our artists, our artistic voices to rise up right? Because any society that does not have writers speaking up right now, society is blind. Because the only writers, only artists can tell you what your pain is. Because the only ones who can tell you can make you understand the suffering. Other people cannot. Other people can glimpse about it. But only a writer, when you read Das, Yvonne Adiambo Wood, you know, even if you read something like Binyabanga, One Day I'll Come Home. You read Major Mwangi, you know, uh, down River Road. You read Grace of Goat. It's only writers who can describe what a society is going through. Ngugi wa diongo. Only writers can describe what a society is going through. So a society that doesn't have writers is dying. So you guys have to step up because our society is dying. The other day I saw a trend of a prominent Kenyan who was being celebrated because he bought a new car. That's the kind of society we have become. Not because he did something of major change. He bought a car. Motogari. Nyamburuko. And now me, I should be praised. Congratulations, Oyunga, on your new Mercedes. This is where we have reached as a society. Where you look at a young lady called Aziad, who I know. Who I know. I should not know Aziad. I know Aziad. Aziad trends because she said, I don't know, I need to be paid. Writers have to write.
Because if we don't write, it doesn't matter whether you're published or not, you have to write. Because if you don't write, our society will die. Because there'll be nobody to hold up the mirror, there'll be nobody to tell us, to show us our truth, which is what's happening to Kenya. We have now forgotten who we are, which is why it's so easy to distract us. All you have to do is look at the Twitter, look at the Twitter trends, look at what's trending, and ask yourself, when was the last time you saw Kenyans interrogating an issue of substance? All we do right now is just discuss personalities. So we need your generation, particularly, because I, I, and I've become a big, big, big prophet. And I, I keep on saying, and I say generation is the millennials and under. Because those of us who are considered generation X, we were broken. What Moy did to us, and I did a beautiful story called um, Fatherless Nation. Yeah? What Moy did to us, Moy broke us. He broke us in ways that we never understood. You know, um, and it's only now some of us at least had the sense to acknowledge that we were broken and we have tried to do healing. But most of other most other people have never recovered, which is why those progressive people who are now in charge of government have just become worse than the ones that we inherited from. Why is it that Jubilee's corruption is worse than the government they inherited from? Why are we talking about a corruption that's worse than Kanu, the Kanu years of, of Moi? Why? These are the young progressive leaders that we looked up to because we were broken. 20 years of structural adjustment programs, the Great African Depression, as, as, as Tandika, Professor Dandita described it, you know, 20 years of suppression, 20 years of intellectual suppression, 20 years of oppression. That's an entire generation, and that's my generation. So the solution does not lie with us. The most we can do is mourn about the good old days, which is why when you follow people like Dr. Wandia and Joya, she's one of the few people who says, who acknowledges, she's into the process of healing and saying, you know, we've got to repair what we lost. But what we are doing, the most we can do as my generation is to tell you guys where we lost the way. We can say, listen, Gabriel, there was a time when we didn't think we were important enough. We just thought oh, we were just there, you know, we're just a young generation. We were being told we were leaders of tomorrow. We didn't quite understand what that phrase meant. Your generation, the country truly depends on your ability to stand up and to be conscious. Because if you guys do not stand up, if you guys are not conscious, if you guys are not politically engaged, philosophically grounded, then this small cabal, this small elite, these thugs, these beasts, these animals, will have us for lunch. So this is what we didn't do enough of during my time. And I think you guys have to stand up and write to the issues that affect you. Write your truth, share it amongst yourselves. If it is good, it will travel. Even if it doesn't travel immediately, it remains as a record to be discovered by those who come after you. So this is my challenge to you guys that understand your time and purpose and your importance, that you are important, especially those of you who have been called towards writing. Those of you who have seen the, all the things that you could do, you have decided to pick this profession of the insane. And you've decided to say, you know what, I'm going to attempt it as a writer. If you have made this choice, then step up and write. This is my message to you guys. No? So, I'd like to leave it at that, at that point, so hope, open it up to a couple of questions. So just so that I, um, yeah, just so we can sort of broaden the conversations. I think I've, uh, if I go beyond that, I'll be now ropokari. So allow me to end it there, yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't know what to say, sir. You know this, I, I don't think any of us expected this. I thought you we are going to come here and uh, massage us and tell us to, you know, to <laughs> to write when we feel like, and you've done the opposite. Eh? I think you've told us more truth than we've had in our lifetime. Mm. We should be uh, philosophically grounded and politically engaged in our writing. Um, Any writer, by their very nature, is political. Yeah. Mm. And uh, we should be able to reevaluate our purpose of writing. Because writing in itself is a thankless job, eh? like they, they would say. You, 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 you brought it so nicely when you said that probably running an Mpesa shop is better. <laughs> if you better, better. Money, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I would not wish to 
uh, you know, to block the questions because I want, uh, let us, uh, you know, when you have legends, eh, time doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so let's use this time. So it's open for you. You, you can uh, unmute and ask a question. Okay. When we have legends, time don't count. Uh, time doesn't count. So let's use this time. <laughs> Who will start? Any question, by the way, Anna? Please. Any I'll question. Go, okay. I'll go first. My name is sure. Chisubire. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, how much do you read? Because the few times I've listened to you, you reference like hundreds of books in every conversation. So how much do you read? And what's your favorite format of reading? Is it e-books, the physical book? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's just talk about reading and writing. Stephen King used to say, um, as a writer, you have to read and you have to read and write. You have to read as much as you write, you know? And, and here's the thing, to, and I, maybe I didn't mention this. We tend to think of writing as the finished product, you know? It's, 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 it's tantamount to saying um, running is, is the finish line. That when, when I say I'm a runner, it only means that when I'm actually in a race and every time I'm doing anything else, I'm not running. Yeah. Val. Val, 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 Val to a webinar, Val. <laughs> Proceed. <laughs> so, 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 so what, I'm, what I was trying to say is that writing goes with reading. Right? So you have, to, you have to read a lot. But here's the thing about reading. I was never taught, and I'm glad I can tell you guys this so you don't make the same mistake I did. Um, so as a writer, you have to read a lot. That's obvious. Huh? It's just the same way if you, want to get into, if you want to get into TV as a director, you have to watch a lot of movies. You have to watch a lot of movies. You know, if you want to be a football coach or a sports coach, you have to watch a lot of games. So it just goes with everything else. If you want to be a cook, you know, you've got to do a lot of practice. You've got to go to a lot of, hang around the kitchen a lot. So you've got to read. But the thing is that nobody told us how to read. Because most of us are traumatized by reading. Because how we're, how we're introduced to reading is very vicious, you know. Yeah. Reading comes with a cane, you know, like, hmm? una soma. Hmm? Oh. soma. And so... We tend to look at reading as this, even, even our whole idea, look at school. When you think of reading, we are like, that's, that's, our, that's our face, you know? Yeah. That's, that's how we read, like now I'm reading, I'm concentrating, you know? We never see reading as something leisurely, sitting back, feet up, no. So the schooling system really pushes, first of all, it punishes us for not understanding. So our introduction to reading is, they start by making fun of us for not reading well. That's the first thing you do. Oh, you, when you went to school, we used to be made fun of for shrubbing. Hey, we must own a shrub. There's a very famous guy now, he ended up becoming a rugby coach. His name is Ogre. Um, Edward Kinyani. Do you know I got the name Ogre? Which, is not, which means ogre. Because one day he's in class and the word ogre was on the table and he was told to pronounce it and he said, it's Ogre. And to date, the man became a Kenyan international. Everybody still calls him Ogre. So this is what happens to us when we first encounter reading. We, we are ashamed, you know, for not pronouncing the words properly. We are ashamed for not understanding. We are ashamed for not understanding the beauty of Shakespeare. Yet we cannot engage with it. So you've got to remember that a lot of us are all carrying this trauma. So what I found out much later, which is kind of sad, but much later is that, for example, if you want to watch movie, I don't know, if you want to watch Netflix or back in the days of DVDs, right, or any one of these streaming services that are out there, uh, uh, what's it call it? What's the one of, of something Max? Um, the, the one, the one from Mnet, no? Um, what's it, what's it, what's something Max? What is it called Max? Sony Max. Sony Max, yeah. So... Show Max. It, Show Max, that's what it's called, Show Max, yeah. What do you do? You do a lot of browsing, right? In fact, most people have like the five minute test. You put in a movie, you watch five minutes, you're like, ah, but this one is not going anywhere. You're moved on. In fact, you can spend almost one hour looking for something good to watch. Uh, but we don't do that with books, you know? So I tell you, for example, Frank Fanon is great. So you go, you pick up the Frank Fanon book, you read chapter, page one, page two, you're like, hey, this thing is conk. But the younger said it's a very important book. So I will suffer with it. 
and you stand there suffering with the book. Yes, indeed, you finished the book, but you haven't got much from it. So in the early days when you're starting out, you know, use the same sort of judgment you use when you're picking up movies for books. Yes, there'll be great books that, you know, you have to read Paulo Coelho, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, you know, that is a recommended book if you're going to be in social justice, you know, you've got to read Walter Rodney, you know, How Europe and Developed Africa. But in the beginning, sometimes you're not ready for a book and books are going nowhere. When I first read Animal, Animal Farm, George Orwell, it was just an, like a random story. It, I, in fact, I missed the politics completely. I did not even see the nuance whatsoever. I just know there's a pig there. You know, it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. It's only years later, literally almost 10 years later, when I revisited Animal Farm, is when I started understanding why they call it a classic. That it was George Orwell's first and true political novel where he managed to merge the politics and the artistic purpose as one, as a complete unit. That's what makes Animal Farm a classic. Because the political and the artistic are seamless. Which is why I can give it to a six-year-old and I can give it to an eight-year-old and they will still relate to the same story. That's the genius of Animal Farm. Now, when I was reading it the first time, I didn't know that. I didn't have it. So, so don't be kind on yourselves. When you find a book that is not that you, you can't get into it. Because if it's good writing, just in the same way in a movie, if it's a good movie, you will, you will watch three hours. If it's a tired movie, you won't go past five minutes. It's the same thing with books. Start with the books that you enjoy. Read the books that you enjoy. Then after a while, you'll start getting the muscle to take you to the, the books that are good, but not really written great. Because a lot of very nice books, but not written very well. I can tell you that for a fact. A lot of the so-called great things we're supposed to be reading are not some of the best prose writers, right? So we suffer through certain readers. I mean, if you were to, and I, I just, I don't, want, I don't want to pick up because there are certain, there are certain biases, huh? uh, but not all writers are, even, even the so-called classic, they're not, as, they're, not as, they're not as enjoyable to read until you come to a place of where you appreciate their style. In the same way, if you're a person who follows, who follows movies, until you start to really understand your directors really well. Hmm? There's a guy called Quentin Tarantino. If you don't understand his style, you know, the guy who made, um, what's, his, what's his most famous thing with uh, God, Quentin Tarantino, Kill Bill, the guy who made Kill Bill. Yeah? If you don't understand his style, it sounds like a very random cinema. You know? if, you don't understand, if you don't understand the guy who made The Godfather, if you don't understand an epic, you won't appreciate the work that goes into it. Right? So take, be gentle with yourself when you're starting to read. You have to read as often and as possible and as much as you can. But what, for, what stops us from not reading is because we pick up bad books. That's part of our problem. So find books that you enjoy. Browse, 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 browse. If a book is not working for you, put it aside. Maybe it's not, it's not time. When you're ready, you'll pick it up again. But good, a lot of reading will help your writing because reading, somebody described it really well, it's like sitting down with, with, it's like sitting down with a sage, because you think about mm -hmm. it, a good book takes a good portion of years to complete. All that mm -hmm. information has been condensed into three, 300 pages, you know? So in order to really imbibe it well, you have to allow. But if it's not entering, please don't, don't guilt trip yourself. You know, mm -hmm. find up there are enough books on the planet that work for you. And as long as they're reading regularly, your writing will improve. Yeah. Thank you. Karibu sana. Pulp Fiction. Thank you so much, Ken. Yeah. Pulp Fiction is the is 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 movie. Yeah. Thank you very much for, I think that is very, um, that is very key. Sometimes we just want to count the books we've read. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I've read 12 books this year, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. the reading challenge. Uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Who'd wish to go next? Uh, I, I, I wish to go next. Please, go ahead, Robert. Um, thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, I'd really like to appreciate, um, uh, is this called exegesis? The, the English word that is, is escaping me. But uh, how you'll be able to unpack the whole conversation of writing. One thing I really appreciate is that whatever you are saying is actually transcends writing. It's not writing. It applies in each and every 
uh, sphere of life, be it yeah. career, be it politics, be it anything. This knowledge that you're given is actually, um, let me say, golden nuggets. It is Thank something you. That you you can't get anywhere anyhow. So I think, as you say, your, your experience encompasses a reality that most people are not in touch with, especially mm -hmm. on issues to do with, uh, like, I remember when you started the conversation, it's about um, um, getting over your ego, like after you have achieved a great high yeah. and learn that quickly and go back because next week people won't remember what you said last week. So I think that's a very important uh, skill, a very important uh, for, for anybody to be able to, to move forward. And you, uh, the other thing you've said that you, you, you are always becoming, like, you are ever becoming. That's one thing I was putting at a nugget from you. And uh, I really appreciate the way you are you're able to package the information. It's actually very palatable. It's, it's like sweet wine. Like when you <laughs> when you speak, you can actually feel the flow. So I really, really appreciate um, how, how you're able to, to play around the words, how you're able to, to communicate with ease and just make it. I, I think we, uh, in the Christian circles, it's called here -E anointing. That's, oh. That is that <laughs> people are able to attract it to what you say. That means your your words hold a, 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 it has this magnetic effect where people are able to hear. Because you can hear that many people can speak, but you can and the, the audience is like uh, four or five people. Now you've begun, we were 37, now we are 30. If to start with somebody else, it could have been by now five people only there in the in the in the meeting. Now we are still hanging on here, hanging on, waiting hard for more information. So I really, I really appreciate. I mean, you have really hit the highs and uh and I, I hope you have gotten my request because I really want to 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 stay in touch and learn more from you. This is just uh, I think the big is, yeah. is this Robert, huh? Yeah, yeah, this is Robert. This is okay. Robert. Um, okay. I, I really appreciate and and I also want to appreciate the Writers Guild for organizing this very because you know uh, Oyunga Padla is a veteran. This is somebody you cannot afford to ignore. You ignore him at your own risk. I tell you. <laughs> yeah. So whatever substance he says, uh, it's like a prophet. His word is can have ripple effect. So really, when it comes to the literary circles, this this is a force you cannot you cannot uh, afford to to dilly-dally around. I mean, it's a, it's a tsunami. So I really want to appreciate and I, I really honor the grace on your life and the, how God has blessed you in that in that area, in that arena. And your journey is really, is really inspiring. So thank you very much. And maybe what I would, I would request, maybe for the house, if the, from the, the recordings, if you can be able to share with us later on, the entire, because some of us recorded from, when yeah. we, there was so much captured in the stories that we forgot that the post track. So you can share with us later on to be able to just to to to, to redigest, take some notes, take some notes, more notes, take more notes, and be able to understand more and more and more. Because some of these things you don't get at one time. Some you get new revelation. The more you you replay, you get new revelation, new revelation over and over. Thank you very much. Over. Thank, thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Robert. Mm. I think what um, what Mr. Yunga said regarding. If you read a book, it's like you're sitting down with a sage. I think today we have sat down with a sage. <laughs> so if you, if you didn't register for the webinar, so we don't have your email, you can type it in the chat, then we'll be able to send you the recording. I, I, I can see a question from Charity. Yeah. I probably um, yes. calculate. Robert, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. Huh? And uh, yeah, I, I see your email there. I'll try and um, send you one, but you can also get my email from, from Gabriel. Yes, yes. Then you can just send me one directly, and lest I forget. But let me let me let me let me get into what uh, Charity has said. Charity has said, "How can writers, journalists be politically grounded yet safe? We have lost some, and others live in risk, sending fear." Um, so, first of all, a very very important question. No? Um, very important question, Charity. Um, if, if, I think fundamentally is the issue of fear, and I want to talk about fear a little bit. Uh, the multi multiplicity of fear um, in, so in, 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 di in different ways. Huh? Um, so first of all, there's two levels of fear. So there's fear, the kind of fear that you're talking about charity, there's fear of the authority, fear of the system. And in Kenya now, we're tending to use the word deep state, right? So this so-called unseen hands behind the scene that seem to have like greater influence um, on society and they uh, apparently can, can, can uh, can, can harm anyone, right? So as, as a journalist, and those of you who might then enter um, into the space of photojournalism, you know, what people like Boniface uh, 
Mwangi were doing, or if you go into investigative journalism, what people like uh, um, G Jopevu before he became Jijoazi and uh, and uh, and what's his other guy and John Alanamo, yeah, um, the kind the kind of stuff that they do. One thing you have to understand is that there's an element of what we call calculated risk. Uh, Mo, Mo Amin, the famous Kenyan photojournalist, Mohammed Amin, um, used to say, "No story, no story is worth dying for," right? Uh, but to get a story, to get a deep story, th there's a certain a level of risk involved, right? Which is why we say you have to calculate the risk. It has to be a calculated risk. If it's a risk that's going to cost you your life, it's not worth it. But the nature of the like, the nature of the profession, which is why it's important that you understand fear from the outside and the inside. So you must acknowledge what is called external fears. There's a famous book that's been written by an Indian guy who calls it, and I forget I forget the name of the writer, but I always remember the title. It's like it's like 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 tickling tick, tickling a tiger's behind, <clears throat> um, and sometimes that's what it feels like we're doing. You, you small guy in the corner there, how dare you criticize the president? Hmm? Who are you to speak against a guambo? You know, like, where do you even start? You know, so there's, so, there's, so, there's, so there's that idea, first of all, that you are too small to make a difference. You're too small to make an, to, to, to have any influence and we can crush you if we need be systemically. So there's the external influence, you know? So it's first of all, you're very under, you, as a journalist, you have to understand your rights First of all, as contained in the constitution, you know, freedom of speech, you know, freedom of thought, freedom of consciousness, um, freedom of association. You have to understand what your rights are and, 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 so, and play up to them because ultimately we must speak truth to power. So there is external risk. External risk is just something you evaluate. Some, of, some people will be braver than others. Mm -hmm. there, will be a, there will be a journal and NAMU and there will be some guys who, I, I don't want to be in the street, may I just be behind the camera, I'll just be in a studio. That's why I'm safe. So depending on where you are, calculate your risks. But there's always going to be some version of an external threat, especially if you're talking against a, a particular establishment. It's always going to be there. All right? So what we call it in our, in, in our game, we say it's an occupational hazard. It's like being a politician. It's just something that comes with it. You know what I mean? If you're a journalist, you'll always be threatened. It's just, it's the nature of the profession. So it's a professional hazard. The idea is that calculate the risk and always remember there's no story worth dying for. Because that is the nature. That's why they call it the fifth estate. You know, your job is to basically critique the core estates, you know, the, the executive, the judiciary, you know, the legislature, to critique them. So, it's you understand that as somebody on the, on the fringe, which is why journalists get killed all the time, it is a calculated risk. So understand what it's a public service that comes a risk. It's like joining the army. It's like being in the police force. There's certain risks you take in this profession. So it's very important that you understand this, especially if you're going to be what you consider a frontline or investigative journalist or somebody who's good, good at provoking. Now, the other fear that we need to talk about that's not talked about is our fear of our own abilities, our self-internalized fear. This fear that stops us from showing up on the page, showing up every day and facing that blank page, that fear. That fear that tells us about that my voice is not important. That fear that tells me that my, my experience is not worthy. That thing, that obstacle, you know, that for me is even a greater obstacle than the obstacle on the outside. Because if you overcome this obstacle on the inside, there's nothing that guys on the outside can do to you. Which is why a guy like, you can remember Jicho Pavio in his day, or you can remember, or if you think about the most exam example now is somebody like Boniface, Boniface Mwangi, you know? You ask yourself, where does that courage come from? The courage comes from, first of all, confronting your own internal fear. It's very important. And, and my way of understanding it is I look at fear as an obstacle. And the obstacle is the way. So every time I sit, and trust me, even at my age with the many years I've done of writing, I suffer from the same problems as any one of you. Every time I have to write a new article, 
you should see the number of excuses I come up with. At least, at a minimum, I have at least 10 standard ones. 10 standard ones. Standard ones, you know. First of all, I have to research. I have to go on YouTube. I have to find out what's happening in Kenya because I won't be able to write without understanding context. Before you know it, I need to get a proper environment. Do I have enough water? Are the doors locked? Um, you know, is this chair comfortable? No, no, no. If I sit in this position for too long, I need to raise my desk. I'll come up with all sorts of excuses to avoid writing. You know, I can suddenly decide I need to catch up with some movie. They suddenly decide there's some email that's even more important than this article that I've set out to write. So that fear is there, you know, and it keeps on recurring. It is like stage fright. Anybody who has ever been in theater and you know what it means and people ask you, when you become a great actor, do you ever get butterflies when you speak in public? And all great orators will tell you, yes, we get the butterflies, but what do we do? We ignore them. You know? So the obstacle, the fear is the way. So you have to face it and then go through it. Because a lot of times it's just an illusion. It's just what's in your head. Because what happens, and good writing sometimes is like, when you start to cook, or if any of you have done, who, 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 has, who has written, who runs, rather, who, has, who, who runs regularly. If you run in the morning, if you're a morning jogger, one of the things they tell you is that just start. In the evening before, put your shoes aside, prepare yourself. In the morning, what's happening? Just start. Your first 10, 15 minutes of running are going to be so painful. You ask yourself, what am I doing at this time in the morning? It is dangerous. It is cold. It is not good for my knees. You know, it's not like I have a weight problem. Why am I out here? But after like about 30 minutes or whatever, how long your run is, you come back from that run and there's a sense of a high. You're like, wow, it was worth it. So approach writing like that. When you finish your writing, you always get a sense of a high, like, ooh, that's nice. But when you're starting, it is so painful, but you have to go through it all the time. That's the discipline of writing, confronting that fear. If you understand your fear, what, what your fear allows you to do, it allows you to be authentic. So by the time you're standing up to then what is authority, the only thing you can say is that, you might say that about me, but I have journalistic integrity. That's all I fight with. If you, if you confront me right now, if somebody ever came up and told me, oh, Yunga, you, you have been used, you're an ODM guy, you know, you're working for the system. The reason why those guys won't scuttle me is because I have my own integrity that I've cultivated over years. And I can stand by it. I have gone through my own internal fear that tells me I am not a fake. I am authentic in this profession which is why I can speak in certain ways. So if you confront the internal fear, then the external fear becomes manageable. In the same way, one of some of the best examples are mothers. Yeah? When a mother confronts her fear, it doesn't matter what is coming up at her. I mean, it could be a lion. You know, A mother will stand up, right? Because she's clear about where she stands. You know, she has confronted a fear and she has overcome it. So even the lion with all its glory and all its ferocity looks at this mother standing up there and says, eh, that's a formidable challenge. So yes, Charity, external threats exist, which is why power is afraid of writers, which is why Moi worked so hard to kill artistic, which is why any society that's, that's oppressive, the first thing they do is they ban the books. The first thing they do, look at Egypt, they jail the writers, they jail the journalists. What's happening in Belarus right now? They've gotten rid of all the correspondents, right? So power fears the writer, but that's the nature of this transaction. Because why? Because power is in like the story of Chris, Chris Henderson, you're the one who has the ability to say, the king is naked. That's what the writer does. The writer is the child that goes and says, the king is naked. And everybody's afraid of the consequences. So the fear in itself is real. It's important to acknowledge it. But understand that the reason you choose this profession is because you've got to confront this fear. The reason we have to confront this fear is so that we can move away from this idea of captivity and suppression that we have inherited. That we live in a country right now where everybody's just afraid. And we warn you guys, your generation very well, because we came from a time where we were not allowed to speak, where it was impossible to have a forum like this without having clearance from a DC. 
right? When you were so afraid, even in public, you didn't know who the spook was, who the spy was. You couldn't talk. We even just speak in codes. We couldn't even say Moe's name. That's how we come up with the word M-O-1. Mazewoni M-O-1. So the fear has to be confronted. If you look at what's happening with Black Lives Matters right now, what is happening is that those black activists, those young black activists, your generation, have stepped up to the fear. They have stopped being afraid, which is why the cops see them and the first thing a policeman does, he has to shoot. Because that's an expression of his own fear, not of his power. The excess that you see coming from the authorities, it's an expression of their own fear. Every time the system resorts to violence, they're expressing their fear. If you remember Kenyan history critically, and I'll give you a number of anecdotes just to help you see it in different ways. The released political prisoners, the group of mothers who confronted the Moi regime at Uhuru Park, right? And did a, a hunger strike at Uhuru Park and they were joined by Wangari Madai. Why would an entire police force come and attack a bunch of women who were pretty much grandmothers? Why was the system so scared of them? Every time the system uses violence, as Martin Luther said, you know you have won because they're afraid, which is what the nonviolent movement was always, was always about. If you look at Gandhi, you look at the, the work of Gandhi, you look at the work of Martin Luther King, you look at the work of Thet Nhat Hanh in Vietnam, the Vietnamese monk. They understood the principle of nonviolence was because if you confront the establishment, with the idea of nonviolence, they can only they can only beat you for so long without becoming that which they're afraid of becoming. You can only oppress you for so long, and this is the contradiction of uh, of black ra of of racism in America, that for so long people have been oppressed, which is what people like Baldwin have been saying that if you continue to suppress me, if you continue to to hurt me, to kill me, you will just suffer as much as I am. I'll leave you with one reference. There's a lady called Asa, Asa, the Nigerian singer. And she did this song called um, Jailer Man. And she said, stop calling me a prisoner. She's talking about speaking, speaking to a, a prison warden. Stop calling me a prisoner because you're a prisoner too. You know, if I'm in jail, you're also in jail. So this is the nature of fear. The system is afraid of somebody really small, right? And that is your true power. If you confront your own fear, then you can overcome the bigger fears. I hope I, that helps, Charity. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I think I find myself taking so many notes that I can't forget to look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> if we can be able to accept uh, some few more uh, questions and engagements, then we can be able to close. Yeah. Um, thank right. you very much for talking with so much passion. And uh, I think <laughs> what you are saying, we are seeing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Rehema, I see you raised your hand. Yeah. Rehema Zuberi. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Rehema. Or any other person who would wish to ask a question? Maybe I, can, I, I can just put it as a note there as well. I'll be able to see it. Mm. OK. Were you, were you scared? Did, <laughs> it appears that I got a question. Yes, Fanon, Fanon, please go ahead. There's a guy called Fanon here. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. OK. okay. Yes, so my was, mm. yeah. Okay, my question was, uh, now that uh, the oppressors of yesterday are still re, uh, depending on writers to write their stories, because we have biographies coming up, uh, so, and we also have many things currently, even um, scholars want their stories written, um, our cities, stories about our, um, and even our entertainers, so what would you encourage a writer to do? 
is there a um, need for maybe specialization so that if you say you're dealing with cities alone as a, as a writer, that's what you deal with? Or, you know, in terms of even going for maybe even books on that, or how would you look at that? Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, it's a good question for now. Um, yeah, first of all, I, I think specialization is good. It's necessary because every profession has some sense of specialization. Right? Even 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 mothers, you know, you know, you, there's the one who's great at making chapels. There's the one who's great with stews. You know, there's the one who's great with daos. Everybody has some sense of a specialization. So that's it's generally a good thing to cultivate. I mean, as much as I try and run away from it, everybody knows me for what I did in Mantok and the kind of writing I've done around African masculinities. So in many ways. If you had to ask me, what am I a specialist at? I'd probably say that, right? Uh, and, and, and perhaps columns. So specialization is good because it helps you sort of deepen knowledge. It's the same thing that applies to academia. When you go into academia, you have to be a specialist in something. You know? So specialization helps just because it helps you deepen, deepen knowledge. Um, it also allows you to have some sense of comfort around a, a scope and an area. Yeah? For example, if you enter in the profession in terms of work, um, I, I, you, you'd say, for example, if you're in a position where you're always around people who are in sport, by writing continuously about sport, you increase contacts in the sports field and you're able to sort of stay, get a lot of work in that area. So that's why, that's why I think special edition is always good when you're starting out. Huh? Uh, it's nice to have some level of, to be versatile, but, uh, but always, but there is, it is necessary to be a specialist in something, right? Don't try and be a jack, jack of all trades. Ultimately, as a writer, you can evolve. And once, once, say for example, you started off with writing about politicians and their shenanigans, you know, uh, that can become a thing, a pal of a kind of um, column, you know? But as you move forward, you can say, okay, now let me go into political satire. And then you can, but at every level, be very clear about when you are moved on to the next thing. So you continue to evolve. Because if you don't, the idea of specialization is deepening knowledge, yeah? And deepening knowledge allows you to be recognized for what you are, which then gives you some level of, 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 um, of career security. So like, for example, if I look at Gabriel, I'm dominant very conversant with a lot of his writing, but I know him, I know him clearly as, a, as, a, as an organizer, you know? So when it comes to like a guy who organizes stuff, I've seen Gabriel do this consistently for the last almost 10 years. So I'll say, you know what? Uh, when it comes to writing and organizing stuff, a guy who comes to mind is Gabriel. Yeah? He probably does a whole bunch of things. He probably has a, a chicken farm somewhere that I don't know about. Huh? Um, but that's the importance of, of specialization. Yeah? That's why I would say um, try and become a specialist in something. Yeah. OK, I don't know if I can go next. Yes, yes, John, please go next. You're the second last. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, first, to really appreciate uh, uh, Pala, you've been uh, phenomenal, and I really like the way you've reinvented yourself over the course of the years. And uh, uh, the fact that you're doing mentorship now is uh, to broaden the mind of, uh, let's say, upcoming writers, young journalists, and so on, which is quite phenomenal. Now, there's this uh, space that you opened up in... Kenya around masculinity, man talk, and so on. I don't know how eager you are to claim this space. I know you've moved on as a writer, but in the minds of uh, readers, Kenyans, you know, this is a space you opened up in ways no one else would, and uh, which basically should lay claim to. And uh, uh, my question was, uh, to what extent then do you think you have uh, perhaps uh, influenced uh, other writers talk about Jackson Biko and, and the others just to write about masculinity. Is this something you would want to perhaps mentor people in, you know, be an authoritative authority, continue being an authority in, or you have moved on completely into uh, the more academic uh, rigors of writing? Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you know, because, you know, when you, you always have that, that, that great student. Huh? <laughs> Who becomes uh, this really big thing, huh? and, and because because become that, huh? um, and um, 
so let's, let's talk about masculinities first, man talk. Eh? So first of all, you know, I've become a very, what you call an accidental columnist. <clears throat> um, um, it, it wasn't my intention. I'm, I'm moving along, minding my own business. And it's, it's like those funny, you see, there's these movies that have been done of where you find yourself suddenly you're the, you're the head of state. Huh? You come into a place and people are expecting somebody important. Huh? And then you arrive there and people think you're the one. And then you have to sort of fall into character. Sometimes I feel like that a lot. It, in the early days, I felt a bit like an imposter. But like, people would come to me. I remember once I was invited to Nairobi Hospital during Father's Day. I think I'd just been writing the column for three years. And these were guys who had been married forever, you know, and they're taking the male wing of, the co- of, 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 of Nairobi Hospital. And these are guys who have kids, you know, like married for many years. And they're looking at me and say, yeah, Oyunga, so we're here to listen to you. And I think about that, this is such a fraud. What am I going to tell these guys, man? And they're like, like me, you know, I'm just, I'm just a writer, man. I don't, I'm, I'm hardly, I'm, I, there's so much I don't know. And which then goes back to what I was tying down with charity, is that fear. I had to confront it. I had to confront it and say, hey, hang on a minute. Uh, actually, I know a little bit more than most. Now, you've got, to, you've got to, I have to, I have to give you context, John, so to understand why technically I can't stay and I can't own it. And I've got to, I'll, I'll give you some context. Now, when I start writing Mantop, one of the illusions we have as writers is that it's all about us. Yeah? It's all about our brilliance, and we are the ones who just came through and brought together this new level of thinking and pushed a conversation forward. I always, and this happened much later, came to understand that ultimately writing is a dance. You know, you it's it's a dance. You need you need an audience. You're a little bit like an you're a bit, you're a bit like an MC who's going, what can you pull? If there's, if there's an echo, if, there, if there's a vacuum there, nothing's going to happen. Huh? If you're just speaking to yourself, it's not going to happen. And in a way, your audience has to dance with you. You know, you, you, you write something, the audience responds, and they push you to the next level. They'll tell you, ah, you can go down, up, and they keep on pushing you. And somebody tells you, no, you should write about this. It's a dance. They keep on challenging you. So you know what I mean? You always go together. You're, you're in tandem with the audience, but never forget who's king. Now, the mistake sometimes, those of us who have the mic, who are on the stage, we sometimes think we are king. We, also think, we, are, we, we sometimes think we're the ones who own the subject. You know, we are the authority. No, no, no. It's those guys who are continuously validating us. If you're a really good looking person and nobody's ever telling you you're beautiful, will you know you're beautiful? If you're a really good looking person and there are no mirrors, you see, so you need the other to tell you how good you were. So that's what made Mantok work, work because Mantok was a generational conversation happening. Now, the reality is this is that when you pass the stage, it's almost like an eight system. You know, you have to move on to the next level of the conversation. You can't, even the Bible says it, scripture says it. You have to let go of the things of the youth. You know? So I had to let go of that level of conversation, which is why then, thankfully, we had the hindsight to mentor somebody to take it over. And I was very lucky that I had an editor who was very progressive because it's very difficult usually to, have a, to be able to sort of endorse who's going to be a successor for a column. It's almost impossible. So I was one of the very few privileged people who could say, I've looked at the horizon and there's a guy called Beacon. I really like what he's doing. I think he has what it takes to move to the next level. Because I understood very well that I had reached my peak. There was only so much I could say about masculinity within that context. Because the context that was needed was an urban modernity context. People wanted to find what was happening with masculinity as it happened on a week-to-week basis. I had reached a point now where I was interrogating the whole structure of male socialization which did not quite fit as easily in the newspaper. It does not mean I stopped my work, but what I understood was now something called, in the academia, they call it intersectionality. I realized there were very many different points that I had to connect with in order to understand maleness better. And this is what I went on to. So in a way, like everything else, the reason I write a column is because of somebody called Mohamed Ntai. 
because one of the the people that I admired the most in this people when I started reading, of all the styles that I saw, Wahome style was the best, which is why I I I aspired to become a columnist. Yeah? But at some point, I had to leave the column and keep on growing. This is what I keep on saying about starting again. Because if you don't, you cannot be a perennial expert. Because even experts have to keep on learning. If you're kind of a university, university professor who got a degree and you stop reading. Tabanda Leong said, he used to tell, when I met him for the first time at the United Kenya Club, when he came to Nairobi, and I went there as an excited young Kenyan, uh, very brash and ignorant at the time. And, and I told him, Taban Leong, oh, the great one, uh, we have been admiring all the writings for this year. At the time, South Sudan was going through conflict. And I said, how can we contribute and help you guys in South Sudan as the African brothers? And Taban Leong looked at me, held me by my ear, hmm, and dragged me to where a bunch of other old men were sitting. And he said, I'm going to say this in front of all this person, so you never forget, the, you never, for, never forget this message, is that forget about us out South Sudanese. We'll take care of our own problems. Write for your people. Write for yourselves. Write about what's happening in Kenya. Write about what's troubling you here. Forget about South Sudan. You know nothing about us. And it was a very sort of humbling moment, you know? And, and Taban Long used to say, you have to get married. We can be, ended up becoming a mentor for me. And he said, you have to get married to scholarship. And I'm meeting a guy who I grew up reading as a young man. I'm meeting the guy is in his past 70s. I'm meeting Saban now when he's about 75. Taban is still taking a bus all the way from Gulu in northern Uganda to Nairobi. And he's got two pieces of luggage, his clothes and like a bag of books. Continuously reading. You know, so you have to evolve. So the, the, the man space, I made my contribution, but it would be a sin if I said my contribution was the most important. You know, people like Magunga have added to that space. People like Silas Nanchwani have added to that space. There's a whole bunch of others. There's a, there's a couple of young women now that I'm seeing writing. Njoki Chege, a whole bunch of other people. The idea is that the most I can do is start. Then I have to move on. Because all we are doing as writers is building into what we call a knowledge canon. We are, when you talk about Hollywood cinema, they talk about it in terms of errors. And because of, because of, because of Denzel Washington, we have Chadwick Boseman. Is that Boseman? Huh? That's his name, huh? Chadwick, the guy who just died. Um, the guy of Black Panther. Because, because of, and because of, and because of Sidney Poitier, we have Denzel Washington. Everybody's just building up on the next. Because of Richard Pryor, we have Eddie Murphy. Because of Eddie Murphy, we have Dave Chappelle. Because of Dave Chappelle, we have Kevin Hart. It's the same way. We are all, it's, we are all part of a continuum. The problem becomes, and we sit in politics, when you sit on the seat and you become head of state and you become the most important person in the land, when it comes to time to leave, you don't want to leave because you want to own that space. So I think it's very important that this is, my, this is my own philosophy. I know writers who would have stayed, and I had the advice as well, I should have just stayed with Mantok all those years. But I figured for where I was and what I was able to contribute, I think I had done my best. I needed to deepen my knowledge. And deepening my knowledge meant I had to come down from that, hill, from that peak and start something new. So, but I think in terms of the contribution to the space, I continue to write about masculinity related issues. If you look at my stuff, I don't write about it as the only stuff, but I still continue to interrogate the issue of masculinity. The last article I wrote about it was, was when Moi died and I gave a reflection and I'll try and find that article for you. Grab it if you, I probably have it somewhere in, uh, in the elephant. Um, the passing of a father figure. Actually, let me, let me get it for you guys. I'll just explain this thing to show you that I haven't quite left, um, haven't quite left, haven't quite left writing about men and male issues. Huh? The only difference is that I understand now very clearly that I am not the authority on this issue. Right? There's, um, I'm just one of the many voices. That's the article it was. I'm just one of the many voices who contribute to the issue of us understanding ourselves better. 
as men. Because fundamentally, as understanding ourselves as men, and this is my journey for you, John, is that once understood ourselves as a man, and as David Mailu says, David Mailu, uh, once you study something that says a man, I realized then I had to see myself as a man within the context of a family, right? So what was the role of my mother and father in making me the man that I was? Then I looked at the context of the family within the context of the community I was brought up in. And the community had been very small, my village in a place called Sinaga in Game, in Siaya County. Then I looked at my larger community, which becomes, for example, my ethnic group. Then I looked at my larger community, which becomes my nationality as a Kenyan. Then I looked further as my larger identity as an African. You know, I looked further as a large identity as a black man. I looked further as a large identity as a, as a contemporary modern man of this era. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that as you start to sort of peel back the layers, as Miguna Miguna would say, as you start to peel back the layers, you start to realizing, wow, there is depth. And this is what we need with all our writers. I think as writers, and if you think any real writer has to go through progression, right? And, and, and some of us have a lucky run and we never get it back again. Others grow from strength to strength to strength to strength, right? There's people who just appear on the scene that make one beautiful song like Dalin P. I've heard of a guy called Dalin P famous Kenyan rapper. He did one beautiful song, we never saw him again. Then there's people like Saudi Soul. 10 years in, you know, uh, you see Saudi Soul when they were starting with Lazizi and Saudi Soul now. You see 10 years of growth. You know, you see people like Nameless, you know, and then there's an Issa. So I, I believe that we, we have to build on knowledge. We have to continuously build on knowledge. And now I think the canon that I'm now contributing to is this idea of what I'm seeing is an African canon, you know, where we are now starting to put our voices, identify our voices, not just as uniquely Kenyan voices, but as African voices. So we speak to African lived experience. And this is where I found myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> I see there are a lot of comments, um, people appreciating you in the comments. So you may be able to have a look, but we can read some. So you, now we can just take one more question. And uh, I, would, I would ask if the question can come from a lady. <laughs> for, for the same reason that uh, the previous one was, uh, came from a gentleman. And uh, yeah. any, any, any last question or any last comment, then we can be able to to close and um, thank God for the time that he gave us with the legend. Apart from my ego, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> and hear someone speak. Uh, uh, okay, Kevin, Kevin, please go ahead. I had asked a question, uh, but I'm not a lady. Uh, so, so, I can't hear Kevin very clearly. Regarding, sorry? Let me ask a question on behalf of a lady as he tries to get clear. <laughs> she had put in the chat, but it has not been seen. Mm -hmm. So, my question arises from what you talked about when you said that we should write from our life lived experiences. Yeah. Does this not just limit our creative space? That, that, that limit our creative space, huh? Um, by, by writing from our lived experiences, do we limit our creative spaces? Uh, which, which is, it's very ironical. This is, this is the irony of it. Huh? Uh, and I'll, I'll take you back to the analogy of a tree, right? Um, you see, when, when a tree starts to, to deepen its roots, right, it seems to go a lot farther. So you look at the roots, they might look a little bit scattered. Huh? They seem to go all over the place. But here, out on the surface, it tends to grow straight. And so the deeper the roots are, the taller the tree is. <clears throat> and, and for me, that's the, that's the fundamental crux of writing from lived experience. Because if you start to deepen, if you start to deepen your experience, then you come, you come across one very interesting magical reality, is that you are part of an interconnected world. Mm. Which is why we can read somebody like Tom Sawyer, 
you know, uh, which is what, who is this, who is this writer called? Uh, Mark Twain, yeah. Um, Mark Twain, an American writer, man, is way out there. He's reading about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, you know, which is the books they forced down our throats uh, in this, you <laughs> know, in, 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 in sort of giving us relevant literature. But nonetheless, yeah. here we are reading about Tom Sawyer. I can relate to the poverty in Tom Sawyer. Yet Mark Twain is speaking about a completely different time. When I read Chinua Achebe, things fall apart. Talking about a pre-colonial era, I can relate to the reality of it because the human story, and this is the contradiction, is also a single story, right? And this is the two sides of the same coin. So here's Chimamanda says, there's no such thing as a single African story, right? Yes. Which is really true. At the same time, there's such a thing as a single human story, which is, means if I speak about pain in Hossa and I speak oh. about Spain in Punjab, it is pain, right? If I'm speaking about yes. suffering in Iceland and I speak about suffering in Malawi, it is suffering, right? So the importance about writing about your own experience is it, for, it allows you to be authentic. And in mm -hmm. being authentic, you start to realize your experience is actually a shared universal experience, which is what broadens you. So in thinking that you're limiting your experience, you're actually doing the contrary, which is why I give you the example of the tree. Mm -hmm. by, by deepening your own experience, you're actually opening up to the wider world. So what the world is seeing, while for you, it looks like a muddled roots under the surface that only you can express, right? The world mm -hmm. is seeing a tree with a full crown that they can completely relate to, which is why literature travels. Mm. People write very personal experiences. You look at all the classics, you know. Shakespeare, what is Shakespeare talking about? He's talking about a complete English reality. Why is it being quoted in Kenyan parliaments? <laughs> it's the same. It's the same thing, yeah. So, you, because, because your own experience is your truth. And if you, if you make a connection with your truth, Anybody else out there who has made a connection with the truth will relate to this truth. Because you have to look at the truth as a singular atom of, of the bigger truth. So all you're doing is revealing the smallness of this atom. But revealing this atom, you reveal the whole. Mm. It's like seeing the ocean in a, gla in, in a glass. You take a glass of water. You take a glass from the ocean. You take go to the ocean, go to Mombasa, you grab a glass. Isn't that the ocean? Right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, but it's not the ocean. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing about, and that's the contradiction. So what you're asking is actually a real question. Yes, it appears, the illusion is that, no, 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 but just talking about myself, I'm, I'm limiting my experience. But the reality is, no, 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 no. You're actually embedding yourself in the ocean. You're becoming part of something bigger. Yeah. Uh, thanks. No, no, Karibu Sano. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I think um the money Gabriel number kuuliza. Okay, okay. Sam. And number sasa kuuliza swali la Kiswahili kuzingatia kwamba Kiswahili lugha Kiswahili lugha ya taifa lugha rasmi. Lakini ukiangalia waandishi wengi wanaoandika ni wanaandika kwa kizungu. Na pia je, ni kwamba soko la Kiswahili na yumba waandishi ama ni waandishi wa Kiswahili ndio tunayumba. Ni kwamba Kiswahili lakini na soko ya waandishi ama ni waandishi ndio you know, and I'll answer in English just because of my articulation. No? Uh, Ngugi talks about language. Yeah? Uh, and Ngugi gives, gives and, and there's two arguments about language. Eh? So who am I speaking to? Uh, Jinani? Samuel. Samuel, huh? Samuel, Sam. Yes. I'm calling Sam. So Sam, and this is, this is the argument of language. And, and it's something a lot of us have grappled with. Huh? Um, so, for example, one of our biggest embarrassments as Kenyans is if you asked me, name your top 10 Kenyan Swahili texts or novels. Most of us, and we've done this experiment, most of us cannot go beyond five. And we'll come back to the, and we'll probably just name books, basically the set books, stuff that we encountered in school. And I can tell you almost 90% of Kenyans have never bought such a thing as a Kenyan, a Kenyan Swahili novel. And if you ask somebody like, 
what is the most important Kenyan Swahili novel? Most people will not even be able to give you. They don't even know where to start. Now, it, it comes from two problems, which is why it's very important to understand the historical basis. One is what people like Zainab Obaka have been arguing about. He's been saying, when we promulgated the constitution, when we started the new constitution, there were two languages. Both of these languages were official languages, which means if you go to an office, there should be, there should be, there should be instructions in both English and Kiswahili. That means you should always have the, the, the ability to say, if I'm going to, I'm filling the Oduma number, this form should also be written in, in, in Kiswahili. Because literacy has been made to, we, have, we look at literacy as only the ability to speak English. Yet we have an alternative language, which is just an official, that's why we call it an official language. Where I'm in Europe right now, in Netherlands, everything is written in Dutch. And everybody here speaks English. So in Kenya, in reality, we should be having a dual, every road sign, everything should be in duality. But what has happened? Because of our colonial legacy, English has superseded everything. So that's the first problem, where we're coming from, Sam. Yeah? Yeah? There's, the, there's just basically the reality of, this, of how the state has been manufactured. The point of where English has been the language of privilege and Kiswahili ni watu kawaida. So that's how it's been worked up. To the point of when we start to think of letters, we wrote a very good thing about Ken Walibora at the elephant when Ken Walibora died. And, and, and you look at, at somebody like Ken Walibora, somebody as prolific as Ken Walibora, and you ask people, why don't, people, why don't he not people, you ask about Ken Walibora, people know him instead as a, as a news, news anchor and as a presenter. They don't know him as a, as a novelist. So, so there's, first of all, there's, the, the, there's a colonial legacy that we're dealing with. But then there's also what we call Swalanyeti now, the real issue here. And, and it's an argument that has been pushed by two people. The first one is Ngogi Wadiongo, who talks about the indigenization of, of our writing languages. And Ngogi argues that you should write in the language that you understand the best, right? So he says that, listen, that's why Ngugi originally starts writing Gikuyu. He switches languages and he starts writing Gikuyu. If you look at Accord Pabitek, Song of Lawino is written in Nacholi, in Nacholi before it's translated. Now, part of the challenge with that, and the, the reason why you have to write that way, because if you don't write in that language, that language will disappear, which is why the Europeans in their small, small nations, Iceland, Sweden, they retain their languages. Because if they don't continue to write their languages, the languages disappear. Mm -hmm. Which is why when you go to South Africa and you, and you find Afrikaans as a language is in literature. You go, to, you go to Asia, the Chinese, the Koreans, the Cambodians, they all write in their own languages. So there's that importance of we have to write because if we don't write, it will disappear. Mm -hmm. The problem with Kiswahili in literature is we're saying is that part of Swahili's challenge, and this is, and this is why I'm speaking in English to answer Swahili question, huh? because if, if I don't explain it properly, you won't understand. Huh? Um, there's a writer called Kalundi Serumaga from, from Uganda. And we had the same argument that, that, you, that this question that you wrote. And when we were looking at the elephant, we wanted to introduce a Swahili edition, a Swahili side. And we would say, listen, for all our articles, we have to have a Swahili version. And the people from Uganda, because when we went to Uganda, we used to make fun of the Ugandans. We told them, you guys, Bana, why don't you speak Swahili, Bana? You guys are letting us down. But we're East Africans. You know? Why aren't you speaking Swahili? What we didn't understand at the time is that unlike Tanzania, unlike different parts of Kenya, is that for a lot of the Ugandans, Swahili was actually the language of the oppressor. So the first encounter with Swahili is Fungo Mulango, Kachini, Toka Hapa, Ondoka. That's the, because it was only soldiers who were speaking Swahili. So, so they looked at Swahili as the language of the oppressor. So they were not interested in it. If you look at my cousins in Shags, in Luanyanza, in Siaya, the guys who basically said, the, they, looked at, they looked at Swahili at the time they were growing up 
as the language of the urban Nairobi guy. Because it's the language of the working class. So they were being told, no, no, no. If you want to advance in this life, know your own language, no kizungu, kidogo to, just to get you around. So there are a lot of these dynamics that Gugi talks about in terms of decolonizing. So what you are saying, Sam, is fundamentally radical and important. There is no reason whatsoever why we are not writing Kiswahili as hard as we're not writing anything else. In fact, there's no reason whatsoever why everything that we write here should have a Swahili translation. There's no reason why you should put an article there and immediately go to Google Translate and you get a Swahili option. So our biggest task is decolonizing our languages. But then there's a flip side. There's a flip side, which I must talk about as well. In a very famous con conversation, and you can find it online, between Chinua Chebe and James Baldwin, they talk about the issue of language. And Baldwin argues that those of us who are in the diaspora, we are stuck with English because we don't have any other language, you know, because we were sort of, we, 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 we were enslaved and we were derooted from who we were. So we have, we have an adopted language, which is English. So we have no choice but to use English. But he kept on asking Chinua, you who are multilingual, who have got Yoruba or, is, is, was Chinua Achebe or Yoruba or is the other side? I think it was, yes, yes, Yoruba. Yeah? You have Yoruba, yeah? you have other languages. Why do you insist on English? You know? And it's the same question that was asked to Fela Kuti. Yeah? Nigeria has like 200 plus languages. Why was Fela singing in English? Now, what Chinua explains, which it became for me a way of just getting over my guilt of the fact that I can't, I can't articulate myself as this well in Kiswahili as I would in English, right? Uh, and, I, and even if I was to have the same thing in Dulu, I'd have a problem. Not to say I don't speak those languages, but in English, English, our brains have been trained in such a way to make English work for us. But Chinua says this thing that is, he was Igbo, Igbo, that's, thank you. Uh, good, it's, it's Wale and uh, Fela who are Yoruba. Thank you, Kevin. So, so Chinua says, you can take a language, but you can own it. You can make a language do what it needs to do for you, which is what Chinua did with English in Things Fall Apart. When you read Things Fall Apart, yes, it is an English, it is a novel written in English, but it is a complete African experience. And that's what, if you think about other people have done with languages, if you look at what the Jamaicans have done with Patio or, you know, Wagwan, you know, what is that? They have taken a language and owned it. If you look at Sheng, what is Sheng essentially? What is it? is we've taken a language and owned it. So there's that level of where we take a language and we manipulate a language to meet our needs because language operates from the idea of a systemic whole. The reason why we have to learn English is because we have to be part of a system. However, our native languages, Kiswahili and our various ethnic languages, the reason why we have to retain them is because they are cultural systems within themselves. So what Sam is saying is actually a fundamental challenge. Yeah? And it's something that I, we all grapple with. Because if we lose Swahili, if we stop articulating ourselves in Swahili, then Swahili starts to die. Yeah? It completely starts to die. And at some point, that language just disappears, as other languages have disappeared. But at the same time, remember, as human beings, we are evolving. Even this thing that we call English, is a bastardization of other languages. It's basically an, an imperial language that was borrowed from others. Kiswahili, as we know it, <coughs> is a conglomeration of other languages. So you also have to understand that there's an evolution all through as well. So the question that I ask is to say, what has been our contribution to the English language? And culturally, we have to own English. So that, and this is what Chinua says really well, is that we have to manipulate this language, break it down so that it expresses our experience. Which is why, for example, we introduce a word like safari. Which is why in Kenyan parlance, there's a thing like wanjiko. You know what I mean? There's a word like uhuru. We have to get this language and make it work for us so it becomes a, a vehicle for our own communication. 
But I must agree with what Sam says. I must agree with what Sam says. And this is our challenge. That we need to preserve the for the future of this country, the language that's going to take us far as Africans is going to be Kiswahili. And this becomes the, the, the challenge of our generation because our generation, and this is the hardest thing, you, can, you can't believe how, which is why you have to, when I say we are broken, our generation were the people who were shamed for not speaking English like Wazungus. They would put this big thing across our necks, you know, <clears throat> that you had to carry that that basically shamed you for speaking your mother tongue or shamed you for speaking with a native accent right so this is the challenge that we're working with this is what we need to decolonize and bring back swahili into a mainstream language not a fringe language that it is and this is the argument that people like zena obaka are saying that the first thing and these are arguments that these are policies that happen at a governmental level the, the government has to do this that kiswahili which means your mother should have the option of either filling the form in Kiswahili or Kizungu. And this is what we have not done nationally. When the president gives a speech, it should be always known that it, it has to be in two languages. Anything that is official has to be in two languages. But this has not happened. So which is why then Swahili has been reduced to then what we call the pedestrian language, Lugayamta, and English has become now the academic language. This is the challenge we're dealing with. So thanks, Sam, for challenging me. That's a really important question. And I'm hoping that the Writer Guild will find a way for us. How can you guys mainstream Kiswahili in such a way that we actually start to encourage people to write in Kiswahili? Yeah, thank you very much for that challenge. You know, we, we started something, uh, <coughs> what we have currently. So we have these sessions every Friday, every Saturday, now that we do them online. Uh, the writer's ecclesia, uh, the one you took part in sometimes at museum. Mm -hmm. So we realized that most of them were in English. So we decided to uh, put them into two. So every time we have an English session, the next is Kiswahili. So every month we have four, two English, two Kiswahili. And we've started a, a specific Tumianza uh, Kitengo Malum Cha Kiswahili, Writer's Guild, Mbayo Inaongozwa Na Fibian Mudama. Na Tunanuia Kuimarisha uzaji wa Kiswahili kwa kile ambacho tunafanya. Sasa Writers Guild tumeanza uh, kile ambacho tumefanya kwa Kiswahili tunataka pia tufanye kwa Kizungu. Na pia uh, we are starting a, a fund to help publish Kiswahili poet, Kiswahili writers. So this is the little that we can do now, but we are hoping to do more with time. No, you've done a lot and, and I'm hoping Sam can be in that thing huh? uh, because that, that's about one of the most important questions I've had in a long time. Huh? Um, so Sam, please, please get involved with this thing. I think, th th think this would be, this would be, um, yeah, Robert, you remember, it was called a disc. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Eh? Such an important question. Yeah. On that note, I give you a chance, huh? We are really grateful. I think today, um, uh, I, even me, I'm someone intimated to this at some point, Robert said that we need the recording of this so that we can listen to it again. Mm -hmm. I have I've come to, I, I need that as well. I just want to listen to this again, replay it again, and pick some things I may have missed. But thank you so much for the session we've had. We thank God sincerely that we had you today and that we've shared this. I've, I've seen also this uh, discussion was being uh, broadcasted live on Facebook through Writers Guild Facebook page. And I've seen another conversation I started there. And uh, there is one of our trainers in the, in the course here called Omoa Ombara from mm -hmm. the US. She's sharing her, her experience as well as you are speaking. She's in yeah. the US and um, she was just saying that there was a time she went to the library and found many Kiswahili books there. So it appears that people are appreciating uh, Kiswahili more than we do. So yeah. thank you very much for the discussion you provoked. I think this is a seed that will grow into a forest. And uh, the tree that you are using to illustrate uh, how grounded writers should be, uh, that tree, I hope, will, be, will result from this conversation. So uh, what you've done today, in our view, is you have planted a seed. Mm -hmm. So we are um, obligated to tell you and to update you how it grows. I believe from this, 
will be able to get people who take writing seriously. And this is what we've been saying all along. Writing and reading is so serious. It is such a, a fundamental unit of our society that we wonder why we, why we have taken it for granted for so long. And this is what uh, Writers Guild is inviting you to so that we can be able to uh, correct this wrong. We can be able to take writing and reading the position where it belongs. Okay. So we invite you all to this journey. You can be able to reach us uh, through any way, uh, any means I've shared contacts there and uh, benefit from the wisdom of our mentors like Mr. Oyunga Pala here. So thank you very much for giving us your time today. We are truly grateful. We are really, really grateful. So your chance to give your last remarks, then we'll be able to let you um, probably get some uh, alea or some osuga. Oh, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> some pelele. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, mean, I just want to say, first of all, just thank you for the honor. You know, and, and I've seen some of the kind things that I've seen on the on the on the chat. Sincerely, thank you so much. You know, when we started out in this profession, we had no idea where it would take us. Uh, and, and, and I'm just glad that I'm, I'm in a position where I'm able to share um, stuff that others might find of value. Um, so, so thank you. And then thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for just, just the, the kind of dynamism I'm seeing in this group, you know, the kind of uh, wokeness that, I, that, that, I, that I've, I've encountered here. You know, what people like Sam are asking me, that, 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 that's, that's amazing. Um, I, I think sort of in, in closing, is, is Michelle Obama says, we are becoming. Right? So we, 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 we and, and I'd like to say, we never quite arrive, you know? We, we continue to grow. And, and growth is perpetual, evolution is perpetual. It's part of our in, instinctual human nature to evolve, you know? Uh, it is when you stop to grow is when you start to age. And it's when you become old, which is why you find old men who are still agile and alive. I think of crucial importance, and, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to tell you guys this, is that you are the generation we have been waiting for. Uh, and I said this with all the seriousness it deserves, you know, uh, because you have a slight benefit that some of us did not have. Huh? One is that you guys have access to information which allows you to, to, to have a lot more insight than some of us, that some of us had, had then, in terms of just the traps of information that's available to you people right now, as a generation. I'm talking about anybody who's under, under the age of 40. Right? And, and especially those of you who have chosen the artistic space, is you are the guys who have to lead the society, you have to reimagine this society. We have to completely reimagine it. You have to divorce this idea that Kenya can only exist as in its present form. You have to become dreamers through your writing and through the art that you express. Because if we do not reimagine society, and I'll give you a quick illustration. In 1963, when the Republic of Kenya is coming to formation, right? We have just come out of eight years of what is a civil war, the emergency from 1952 to, 19, to 1960, literally. <laughs> and in these three years, we hunker something together, which is sort of like a political establishment. And in 1963, we have a, we have, we have a country, an independent country. In 1964, we have an independent republic, right? And we have to put it together. In 10 years time, this assortment, this country that was just was, was nothing the other day, becomes a major functioning economy that is thriving more than even the Southeast Asian countries, which is why we keep on, you hear that example all the time, in 1970 something, Kenya was, the economy of Kenya was bigger than the economy of Korea, you know, and Malaysia. It is because the founding fathers of the society, founding fathers, not father, because that's the propaganda of the day, is because societies are built by a collective, not by an individual. Because the founding fathers and mothers of society, they came in here and they applied themselves 
which means in less than 20, 15 years, we had a functioning public education system. We had a functioning public work system. We had a functioning public education system, which means any school you went to had the same standard. We came from zero to 60 because that was a generation that imagined the future. The mistake I think the generation did is that we focus too much on the hardware, the beautiful roads, the infrastructure, you know, the, all the other things. We didn't focus enough on the software. Your generation, I think, has the opportunity to do something different, right? At a time when a country like ours has lost its soul, we need a generation that can wake up and reimagine this space for us. Because what Kenya suffers from is a crisis of imagination which is why even look at all our political negotiations, it's all about we can't imagine ourselves beyond these constructs that have dominated us for so long. So the job is for you guys to reimagine something afresh, to give us a new picture, a new way of which we can become. And I think for me, that is the burden of your generation. And, I'm, and I think you have it in yourselves to pull it off. The very fact that even the Writers Guild exists, the Writers Guild should have been formed by people like us, those of us who are considered veteran writers. Why don't we have a Writers Guild for our generation? We have a political organization called the Kenya Union of Journalism, purely for capital extraction and political negotiation. We don't have a guild that builds writing. You are the generation that can make that difference. I am completely convinced. I have seen what your colleagues are doing with Black Lives Matter around the world. You know, I am completely convinced the other generation that can switch it for us. So it's very important that you believe in yourselves and do not think of yourselves as insignificant. In the year 2000, 2000 1999, I was just one voice who was saying, uh uh, men are different. I was just one voice. Do not underestimate your power. Yeah. And I'm hoping you guys can, can, can really live up to your callings.